Copyright 2015 Samantha Price All rights reserved Chapter 1 And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Revelation chapter 19 verse 9 Abigail Fisher stood in front of the mirror, tore off her prayer cap and threw it as hard as she could to the floor. Everything is against me. I can't see an end to these problems that David has left me with. Even God is against me, why else would I be in this mess, she thought. She took the pins out of her hair and unraveled her dark red hair. It floated about her in waves, ending below her waist. Her blue-gray eyes fastened on her reflection. Abigail took a deep breath and picked up a handful of hair holding it straight above her head. With her other hand she picked up a large pair of silver scissors and with one sharp snip her hair fanned silently over her bathroom floor. With several flicks of her wrist the floor was covered with hair. Abigail stood with her bare feet on the cold stone floor staring at the hair about her feet. Instead of regret, a sense of liberation washed over her. It was the first time in years that she'd made a decision without worrying about what other people thought and without worrying about what was right or wrong. Cutting her hair would have been against her late husband's wishes, and was definitely against the awning. Abigail stared at the reflection of the jagged ends of her hair, she snipped at the ends until they were even. She was satisfied that no one would ever know she had cut it, since it would always be hidden under her prayer cap. She was sure that she was not the only Amish woman who had ever cut their hair. Hair is a woman's crowning glory, her mother had always said. Abigail knew it was most likely an act of defiance or an act of rage, but at least it was an act that made her feel better. Abigail gathered handfuls of her freshly cut hair and carried it out to the trash basket in the utility room, hiding it at the bottom so Faith and Ben would not see. She returned to the bathroom, fastened her hair on her head and fixed her cap back on. Her secret would be safe. Abigail could not prevent her mind returning to a time when her life was simple, a life where she took pleasure in things such as needlework. She strode out to the living room and glanced over at her long-forgotten sewing cabinet. She was drawn to open the door. Abigail carefully unfolded the sampler she had been working on before David went home to be with the Lord. She hadn't even thought about doing any needlework for nearly a year. Abigail sighed loudly, pushed the sampler back in the cupboard and closed the door with a thud. Her needlework and anything else that gave her pleasure would have to wait a while longer at least until her debts were paid. Things so frivolous as needlework were the last things that should be on her mind, now that she had so many things to worry about. How many trials is God putting me through before he sees that I have had enough? She mused how quickly her simple life had changed. A year ago, I didn't have a care in the world. I could spend my days cooking and gardening. Needlework was my pleasure when everyone was asleep. Abigail let out another heavy sigh, as she recalled that the Bible says that God would not test a person beyond what they were able to endure. Abigail was sure she had more than reached that point. She could endure no more disasters in her life. As if things hadn't been bad enough, they quickly worsened when Abigail learned that the two businesses that supported her family were in financial trouble. Massive debt, were the words her accountant used to describe the mess the B&B &B and the restaurant were in. It was painful for Abigail to acknowledge that all the hard work her husband had put into the business had not reaped the rewards they had hoped. Abigail was thankful that her newly married daughter Faith and her new husband Ben were living with her. It wasn't easy having a stranger in the house. Ben was a nice boy, but it wasn't like having close family living in the house. She remembered that it was she who was once a stranger to this very same house. It was David's parents' house when she came to live there so many years ago as a newlywed. How can I begrudge Ben living here? I'm such a crotchety person sometimes. Besides, if Faith and Ben weren't living here I'd be all alone, she thought. Through the window, the huge orange sun lowering in the sky reminded Abigail that it was almost time to begin the preparation of the evening meal. She strolled to the kitchen and made herself a hot tea, then settled close to the wood heater to enjoy a few quiet moments in silence. Abigail reached forward and opened the door of the heater to watch the hypnotic flames perform a merry dance. As she sat, her face became engulfed with a wave of heat. I'll have to make a new life for myself. I'm far too young to wither away as a sad, lonely widow. I will find myself a new husband. No God will find one for me, she thought. 
She stared into the flickering fire once more, and amidst the crackling of the fire Abigail prayed. God I need someone to love and to care for, so please find me a good man. And if it's not too much to ask, I pray that I be blessed with another child. Abigail touched her tummy gently with the palm of her hand. She wondered if that were even possible since she was in her late forties. Then she remembered Sarah from the Bible. God enabled Sarah to have a child when she was well advanced in age. Abigail closed the door on the fire and took a sip of tea. Abigail wondered if she still had as much faith in God as she had before she was besieged by one problem after another. The plain truth was that her life was spiraling out of control and she was helpless to stop it. Without David, a void was left in her life, and she knew only another man would be able to fill it. Warmth filled Abigail's heart as she considered the two men who she knew were interested in her, even though they had never said as much. The first was Richard Black, who some people referred to as a loan shark. Without the money he had loaned her, she was sure the restaurant would have gone into foreclosure. The second man was Jacob Lapp, a wealthy widower, who she had unsuccessfully tried to pair up with her daughter Faith prior to her marriage to Ben. Neither man was perfect, as Richard Black was an Englisher and Jacob Lapp was a good ten years younger. Abigail sighed. I'm not perfect either. I'm cranky and I'm most likely too old for either of these men. It was obvious to Abigail that the Englisher favored her, as he continued to ask her on dinner dates under the ruse that it was research for her restaurant. The widower Jacob took every opportunity to speak with her at every meeting, barn raising, everything. I see a light in Jacob's eyes when he speaks to me, which is not there when he speaks to other ladies. A smile of satisfaction tugged at the corners of her lips as she realized that men still found her attractive even at her age. Her smile was quickly wiped away when she berated herself for unnecessary pride, but it was no secret that the young attractive women in the community, as well as the attractive men were always the first to marry. Abigail took another sip of tea before she added more sugar. I am determined I will not become a sad or lonely old lady. I will not be wanting for food or shelter either. Abigail knew that with the financial mess the businesses were in, she might very well be homeless if things did not turn around soon. David had always said that he would have stayed on the farm if their five daughters had been boys. Abigail knew her life would have been very different if they had kept working the farm. If she'd had boys, they would have had thriving crops and she could have helped out at the farmer's markets to sell their produce. With all his girls, David saw that the best way for him to provide for his family was to open a restaurant. Once the restaurant was doing well, David seized an opportunity to buy the adjacent building to turn into a B&B. &B. Annoyance at her late husband's decisions rose within her. He left me with debts and problems, which I didn't even know we had, until he was gone. Abigail tried to still the bitterness in her heart against David. It wasn't just that he'd left the family with debts, Abigail was upset because he had not even told her that he had taken out a loan from a bank. David had always said to others that he would never borrow money from a bank, as that would make him unequally yoked with unbelievers. Abigail's ponderings returned to her two suitors. She was pleased that they were both wealthy even though she knew that she should not care about such things and as a person's financial status, but while she still lived in this world she could not deny that it required money to live. I just need and deserve enough to live on, after all the hard work David and the whole family have put into the businesses. I don't want to worry about money ever again, she thought. Before she faced money problems, Abigail never considered money, but now she worried about it constantly. She was determined to get her family and herself out of the mess that David had left them in, one way or another. The concept of time had slipped out of Abigail's mind as so many thoughts flooded her head. The sound of a buggy clip clopping across the driveway told her that her quiet time had come to an end. She raced to the window to see Faith pulling up. Abigail quickly threw the rest of her tea down the sink and set about fetching vegetables from the utility room. Tonight will have to be an easy dinner of beef casserole, a variety of vegetables and fresh bread, Abigail thought. If it were up to Abigail, she would not bother with dessert at all, but with Ben to feed, dessert had become a constant on the menu. The dessert tonight was to be blueberry pie, but as time ran out Abigail made the quick decision that dessert would have to be shoofly pies instead. The pies were quick to cook, only taking ten minutes in the oven, and Abigail knew that Faith would help her make them. Hello mom. 
Ten minutes later, Abigail heard Faith come through the door. Hello, I'm in the kitchen. Faith entered the kitchen and filled a cup with water from the pitcher. Abigail sharpened her small vegetable knife. Did you give Blackie a good rub down? Faith took a mouthful of water. Yeah, Mom. You always ask me that, and I always give the horses a rub down before I put them away. You never used to. That was only once when I was younger. I always do it now. Faith drank the rest of her water in one gulp. Okay. Faith peered over her mother's shoulder. Need some help with the vegetables? No, it's under control. We're having beef stew and you can help me with the shoofly pies later. Wonderful, I love shoofly pies and so does Ben. Ben worked on his family's farm until dark, six days a week, and always had a very hearty appetite. How did things go at work today? We were pretty busy. Faith picked up a small piece of carrot that her mother had just cut and popped it into her mouth. That's always good to hear. Yeah, and Richard Black came in looking for you today too. Were you supposed to meet him? No, I've arranged to meet him tomorrow. I wonder if he had his days mixed up. Faith laughed. I don't think Richard Black would ever have anything mixed up. I think his life is totally rigid and ordered with not a thing out of place, ever. Abigail pushed the slices of carrot aside and began to cut the potatoes. I suppose you're right. He doesn't even have a hair out of place, does he? Faith picked up another piece of carrot. I'd say he's got a little crush on you. Abigail's mouth fell open, and the knife she was holding so skillfully fell straight out of her hand skidding across the work area. Why would you say such a thing? That was a strong reaction. Faith put her head to the side and stared into her mother's blue-gray eyes. Are you telling me you have never thought the same thing? Abigail put her head down and snatched the knife up. I'd say he's all about business. Besides, he's most likely married already. Faith stepped closer. Most English men wear a wedding ring, and I've never seen one on his finger. Faith put her hands on her hips. I don't think any wife would be happy with their husband taking another woman out to dinner. So I'd say he's not married and definitely single. For sure and for certain. Abigail popped the carrots and potatoes into a saucepan. Well, if he is or isn't, it's nothing to do with me. Yeah, I'd say he's single and ready to mingle. Abigail swung around to face her daughter. Hush, Faith. That sounds like a horrible thing to say. Wherever did you hear such a thing? Faith's chin dipped down. It's not a rude thing, Mom. I heard it at work, I'd say. Well, I don't like you saying things like that. It's too English, and I'm surprised to hear you say such things. Have you ever heard your dad or I say such things? Sorry, Mom. Faith lowered her voice and said, I'll go clean up and then come down and help with dinner. Just as Faith left the kitchen, Abigail heard the sound of Ben's horse and buggy heading for the barn. A while later, Ben opened the back door, which led into the kitchen. Evening, Mom. Hello, Ben. It always amused Abigail when Ben called her mom. He was the only son-in-law that called her mom. The others always called her Mrs. Fisher. After being called mom by her girls, it was strange to be called mom by such a masculine voice. Ben tilted his face up and inhaled deeply. Dinner smells wonderful as always. Abigail laughed. Well, I hope it tastes good. Faith's helping me to make shoofly pies for dessert. Ben clapped his large hands together, and his face was consumed by a large smile. And where is my lovely wife? Upstairs, I think. When you see her, tell her to hurry and come down to help me here. Abigail smiled to herself as she recalled being young and in love. Abigail loved David when they first married, but found over the years that the love hadn't faded, but it wasn't the same butterflies in the tummy sort of love that she'd had in the early days. Did God mean them to be together? or should she have married Adam Yoder as her mother wanted? At the time, Abigail was torn between the two men but chose David. Adam Yoder moved away from Lancaster County after she married David. The last thing she heard of Adam was that he married shortly after he moved to Ohio. No, my mind is playing games with me. I'm pleased with my decision to marry David, she thought. After dinner, Abigail's eyes were drawn to a few cardboard boxes at the foot of the stairs. Now, when are you going to unpack all those boxes, Ben? Ben scratched his chin. Well, I could do some of it tonight. That would be good. 
I don't like the place being messy. When she saw the glance Faith gave Ben, Abigail added, I want you to think of this house as your home but I just want it to be organized and neat. Like it was before you moved in. Mom, Faith said quickly. I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean that. I know that Ben has just moved in, but the quicker we can all get integrated, the better. Don't you think so, Ben? Mrs. Fisher asked. I totally agree. As soon as I get properly unpacked, the better. He turned to Faith, smiled and touched her shoulder. I'll move all those boxes up to our room tonight. Abigail was sure he would agree to anything as long as he had Faith by his side. It was plain to see that the two of them were deeply in love, so much so that it touched her heart. Now you two disappear out of my sight right now, before I make one of you help me with the clearing up. I'll help you, Mom, Faith's tone was insistent. Abigail playfully slapped Faith's outstretched hand away. No, you won't. I'll do it tonight. Thank you, Mom. Faith leaned over and gave her mom a kiss on the cheek before she disappeared up the stairs with Ben. Ben turned around when he was halfway up the stairs and picked up one of the cardboard boxes and made his way up the stairs. He caught Abigail's eye. See, I'm starting already. Good, Abigail called after him then said under her breath, it's about time. Abigail carried the dishes to the kitchen sink, then let out a heavy sigh. Oh, to be young again. Once Abigail's hands were in the sudsy hot dishwater, her mind was drawn to Richard Black who she had a meeting with tomorrow. She wondered if he would suggest visiting another restaurant. So far, they had been to four local restaurants for dinner. It was all research, of course. Abigail saw the funny side of Richard's games and giggled to herself. I wonder if he thinks I really believe that it is research. It hadn't escaped Abigail's notice that Mr. Black was always trying to entice her to drink something alcoholic. He knew that a lot of Amish folk drink alcohol in moderation, but Abigail had never had a drink in her life and she did not intend to start now. She wanted to be in control of her mind and was a little nervous of stories she had heard of drunken people who lost control. I think he was trying to loosen my morals by getting me drunk. Abigail could not deny she found something very likable about Richard Black, but there was a small, still voice inside her telling her that he could not be trusted. After she washed the dishes and cleaned the kitchen, Abigail turned off the overhead gaslight and took a small lamp into her bedroom. David had built the bedroom and ensuite onto the house five years ago. She was grateful that the community she lived in allowed plumbing in the house, as some of the older order Amish still used outhouses. Since David had gone to be with the Lord, Abigail always double-checked that the second door which led straight outside was locked and bolted. Abigail changed into her nightdress, turned down the covers of her bed and moved her large tabby cat Timmy in the process. Timmy let out an offended yowl. The cat spent most of the day sleeping on Abigail's bed, only spending brief moments outside. Stop it, Timmy. Timmy moved slowly to the end of the bed, curled up again, and offered a tiny growl almost under his breath. Abigail was certain that Timmy thought it was his bed. Timmy was not a friendly cat even though the family had him since a small kitten. He was known to lash out with a scratch or a bite for no apparent reason. Abigail let Timmy get settled to sleep while she sat in the easy chair by the bed and read from the large print Bible that used to belong to David's mom. Abigail found it increasingly hard to read small print, and by gaslight she had a little more trouble seeing the words than she did in natural daylight. Abigail found comfort from reading the Psalms and made sure she read a chapter every night. After she read Psalm chapter 23 she closed the Bible, climbed between the covers of her bed and turned off the light. Thank you God for another day and thank you for looking after my children. She closed her eyes and tried to sleep, but thoughts of David invaded her mind. Had she prayed for him that terrible day as she did most days or had she forgotten to do so? I'm being silly even if I had prayed that would not have stopped God from taking him home, everyone has to go home sometime, she reasoned. Constant questions rang through her mind regarding David and whether she could have prevented his heart problem in some way. The family rooster was always Abigail's wake-up call. He was very old, but that did not stop him from crowing at the crack of dawn. Abigail yawned and put her hands over her head and stretched her entire body, feeling her body grow taller as she stretched every muscle. Another day, hopefully I will get through this one, she thought. Abigail dozed for a moment before she got out of bed. She put on a warm robe, and then hurried to the kitchen to light the fire. 
The morning was so cold that Abigail ran and jumped back into bed until the fire warmed the kitchen. Abigail always dressed for the day before she made breakfast. Once she gritted her teeth and forced herself out of bed for the second time, she brushed out her recently cut shoulder-length hair. Her hair was so much easier to care for now it was shorter. David would not have approved of her cutting her hair, or approved of the mirror that she recently purchased. David was raised without a mirror in the house, and he said that his family should follow that tradition, but Abigail thought one a necessity. She did not consider herself to be a vain person. A mirror was just a convenience as was her new short hair. Abigail pulled on her dress and apron and then secured her hair with pins, lastly she fixed her prayer cap on. She took a step back and looked in the mirror to see what Richard Black saw when he looked at her. She saw a small-framed woman who was such a contrast to Richard's large frame, she considered they would look odd as a married couple. Abigail shook her head at her ponderings. What am I thinking? He's an Englisher, and whatever interest he has in me, I'm sure marriage has nothing to do with it. Timmy growled at the door of her bedroom. Abigail opened the door slightly, and Timmy aggressively pushed his way outside. Chapter 2 Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Jude Chapter 1 Verse 21 You're coming to the restaurant with me today, aren't you, Mom? Faith stood in front of the stove and rubbed her hands together. Yeah, I've got a few things to do. I've got a meeting with the accountant, and then a meeting with Richard. Abigail brought plates from the cupboard and set them on the table. Has Ben gone already? You know he always goes early, Mom, way before daybreak. He collected the eggs before he left, though. Abigail put one hand on her hip as she said, Why don't you get up and make him a good meal before he leaves for work? Faith turned her back to the stove. I work too, Mom. He likes to get his own breakfast. I went to get it once, but he told me to stay in bed. Hum. Abigail shook her head. He spoils you. Faith smiled. He looks after me, but I work too. If I didn't work, I'd most likely get up before him and make him breakfast. Abigail entered the utility room and came back with some flour and milk. I thought I'd make pancakes for breakfast. Oh, I love pancakes. Can we have it with zucker and lemon? Yeah, of course. I don't know why I haven't made pancakes lately. There's something about the cold weather approaching that makes me want to eat pancakes. Abigail arranged the flour, eggs and milk in front of her. Faith sat at the table in the kitchen. Do you want me to do something to help? You could make the café. As Faith rose from the table she asked, What's happening with the money situation? It's better, isn't it? I hope so. Both businesses have increased in their takings. I'm just hoping the increase is enough to pay back both loans. Faith bit her lip. It's all a bit scary. Abigail put all the ingredients into a bowl. She had made pancakes so many times before, she did not need to measure the quantities. I know, but we have to have faith. Have faith, Faith. Faith laughed. I've always wondered why you called me Faith. Abigail looked up from beating the pancake mixture. I had four girls and wanted one more baby, I didn't mind if I had a boy or a girl. She gave a little sigh. Verity's birth was very difficult, and the midwife had to send me to the hospital. They told me that with my complications, I would never be able to have another child. Faith gasped. You never told me that. No, only your dad knew the doctor told me that. Abigail took a deep breath. When Verity got a little older, your dad and I prayed for another baby, and we both knew that we had to have faith. Abigail poured the mixture into the hot fry pan. When you were born we knew that faith was the perfect name for you. It was faith in God that created you. Mom, that's so sweet. Why haven't you ever told me? Abigail shrugged her shoulders. I guess I never found the right time until now. I'm happy to know that. If I have a daughter, Faith will be her middle name. Abigail's jaw dropped. Faith, you're not, are you? Faith laughed. No, Mom. Not yet, anyway. Give us some time, we've only just married. Abigail scooped a spoonful of mixture into the hot frying pan as she pondered how blessed she was to have her five girls. Abigail waited at the usual table in the back of the restaurant where she always had her meetings with Mr. Black. 
While she flipped through her paperwork, she saw Mr. Black out of the corner of her eye. She looked up and smiled at him as he walked briskly toward her. As he sat down, she asked, Coffee? Yes, I'll have a coffee today. As soon as he spoke, Abigail remembered that he usually had tea and she had offered him coffee. She made a mental note to be more attentive to things such as what people drink. She put her hand up to signal to Faith. Once she caught Faith's eye, she pointed to Mr. Black and mouthed the work cafe. Moments later, Faith set a coffee in front of him. Thank you, Faith, Mr. Black said as he moved the coffee cup a little closer. You're welcome. Faith turned to her mother. Shall I sit in on this meeting with you? Abigail touched Faith's arm. No, I can handle it, Faith. Do you want anything to drink, Mom? Abigail shook her head, and then Faith left them alone. Richard pushed back heavily in his chair. I've done some number crunching with the last set of figures you gave me, and things don't add up. He arched an eyebrow slightly. Do you trust your staff? Abigail pursed her lips. What do you mean? Are you saying someone might be stealing or something? Exactly. Abigail screwed up her nose. We've had the same staff for a long time. We have a few casuals in the busy times, but we've never been short of money when we reconcile at night. Richard straightened his back. I'd keep a closer eye on them if I were you. Who does the purchasing of the food? That would be Shane. He's definitely trustworthy, he's been with us forever. Abigail did not consider it a possibility that one of her staff was stealing from her. Besides, they were all Amish except for Shane and she trusted him. Richard rubbed his chin. How does he purchase the food? Abigail's eyes momentarily flicked to the ceiling. He goes to the markets early in the morning, well most mornings, and buys what we need. Does he supply receipts for what he buys? Richard fastened his intense gaze onto Abigail's eyes. Of course he does. Abigail snapped her words out and immediately regretted her tone. Richard was only trying to help her. Where do the receipts go? I assume you do keep them. Yes, we keep them. Abigail nodded and her fingers fiddled with her apron. They go into a tin in the kitchen. Who checks the receipts? While Richard fired questions at her, she realized that the finances were not followed closely. The finances of the B&B &B were in Reuben's hands, but the finances of the restaurant were once David's department, and now they were obviously higgledy-piggledy as both she and Faith struggled to do more than they could handle. Well, they aren't really checked until we need to check them. No cash changes hands. We pay the suppliers at the end of the month when they send us the accounts. Richard shook his head. What if a supplier made a mistake and overcharged, would you know? Abigail's shoulders tightened. She knew that a lot more work needed to be done to tighten the finances. No wonder things had gotten into such a mess. I guess not, not unless something looked odd or if it looked a larger amount than normal. Richard leaned forward and held Abigail's gaze, obviously trying to get his point across. That's what I was afraid of. That's what I meant about keeping your finger on the pulse. You need to account for every cent that leaves this place. I thought we were. I didn't think we would need to do that. Her voice was small and fractured, but she was determined not to cry. The finances are a bigger problem than a mistake or two made by a supplier, aren't they? Richard nodded. He let out a deep breath, put his elbows on the table, and then placed his chin in his hands. Can someone other than Faith help you with all this? What about Reuben? Abigail put her hand to her throat and coughed. I don't want Reuben to know about all this. Verity will only worry, and I don't want them to feel that they aren't safe in the B&B. &B. It's where they live. Richard shook his head slowly. Don't you understand, Abigail? They might not be safe. Things could go pear-shaped with the two businesses. Better they know now, then get a nasty shock later. Abigail pressed her lips together. In a sense, she wanted to protect David so no one would learn that he'd borrowed heavily from the bank. If you really think things are that bad, then I will tell them. Good. I think the sooner they know, the better. Reuben has good business sense, and I'm sure he'll be able to get things back on a level footing. Abigail nodded, thank you for helping us with all this. I don't know what I would have done if you hadn't come along. Richard smiled, reached out his large hand and placed it over Abigail's. Chapter 3 
and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. Genesis chapter 2 verse 22. As soon as Abigail arrived home, she noticed that Jacob's buggy was there. She couldn't see anyone in it, and when she looked at the house she saw him sitting on the porch. Jacob. She wondered if she'd arranged to meet him and forgotten. As she reached the porch he rose from the chair and said, Come on a buggy ride with me tomorrow, Abigail? Abigail couldn't help but laugh at what he had just said. Really? She'd always had a feeling that he liked her. Asking her on a buggy ride was confirmation of that feeling. But were they going to go on a buggy ride as 16-year-olds do? Yeah, I'd like it if you would come out with me. I've arranged something special. Okay then. Abigail nodded her head slightly and again wondered if she had misunderstood his intentions. Are you working tomorrow? Jacob's eyebrows furrowed slightly. Abigail shook her head. Jacob brushed his dark hair away from his brow. How about eleven? Okay. Abigail could feel her heart beating out of her chest. She licked her lips. Come inside and I'll fix some hot tea. You must be freezing waiting out here. Jacob shook his head and headed toward his buggy. Thank you but I've things to do. As he reached his gray buggy he turned and gave Abigail a grin, then climbed in and clicked his horse forward. Abigail was rooted to the spot as she watched his buggy disappear into the distance. What am I getting myself in for? Is he truly interested in me? Her mind flew to the time she was trying to pair Jacob with Faith. Faith was insistent that he was too old for her, and she also said that she wouldn't be able to handle his two children. Now I'm wondering the same thing of his children. No, I'm getting way ahead of myself. It's not as if he's just asked me to marry him, she reasoned. The fact was, though, that there was very little choice of a husband when middle age was reached. Most Amish people married young and there were so many people to choose from, but as age increased, choice decreased. I wonder if Jacob knows what he's doing, I'm so much older than he is. I guess it must not worry him. No matter what attraction she had to Mr. Black, she would never consider leaving her Amish life to marry an Englisher, not at her age. I'm too old to change my ways, and I believe that God does not want us to mix in marriage with the English, she thought. Jacob Lapp was a far better match for her than an Englisher like Richard Black. She was fond of Jacob's children, Tracy and Lizzie. She considered the only drawback to Jacob as her husband would be Jacob's mother, who was a very odd woman indeed. Abigail decided to keep Jacob's visit a secret and not even let Faith know of it. She figured it best to tell no one just in case it went nowhere. It was hard keeping things from Faith, but some things were best kept private until the time was right. The secrecy surrounding her time alone with Jacob reminded Abigail of the days that she and David were courting. No one knew of their romance until they told both sets of parents that they were to be married. It had been some time since Abigail had thought of her younger courting days. David had been one of two men she was interested in, just as she was interested in two men right now. The only difference was in her younger days both the men were Amish, now one of the two she was interested in was English. As Richard Black suggested, Abigail decided that she would have to inform Verity and Reuben of the financial situation that they were in. She would never have told them if she hadn't been urged to do so, but she figured if things were so bad it made sense to tell them now. As they sat around the dining table at the B&B, Verity asked, What's this meeting about, Mom? What have you been keeping from us? What do you mean, Verity? Abigail tipped her head to one side as she looked into the eyes of her daughter. I've known for a while something is going on, with you and Faith whispering about things all the time. Verity frowned deeply. Abigail knew then that she probably should have mentioned things sooner, and wondered if her daughter and son-in-law were going to be angry with her for keeping things from them. She took a deep breath and sighed. It's the finances. Reuben leaned forward, yes? Unfortunately both the B&B &B and the restaurant are in trouble. She looked directly at Verity. Your dad borrowed money from the bank and we've been struggling to pay it back. Verity's eyes flew to her husband who quickly held her hand. Reuben lowered his head and said, I see. Abigail looked down at her fingers, which could not stay still. She lowered them beneath the table so they would not give her nervousness away. Richard Black loaned us some money to get us out of trouble. Thankfully, 
The money from the B&B is increasing all the time. Reuben shot his head up at Abigail's words. Richard Black, I know the name but I can't remember where from. Reuben rubbed his dark beard. Abigail nodded. He says that he knows you too. Reuben put his hand in the air. It'll come to me. Abigail continued, everyone including the bank is saying that our outgoings are too high. Reuben was quick to speak. Not the outgoings from the B&B. I keep a very close eye on things. The takings are steadily increasing, and our outgoings are below industry average. I understand, but it's not the B&B. It seems to be the restaurant that has high outgoings, higher than they should be. I have to say that according to the figures across both businesses, it was the B&B lying vacant for so long that dragged things down. Abigail did not like to say such things, but now she was telling them about the borrowed money she figured that all things should be said. Reuben dropped his head, and Verity put a comforting hand on his shoulder. Abigail took a deep breath, and summoned the courage to continue. Reuben, no one's blaming you at all. Reuben squirmed in the chair. Well, it is my fault that it was vacant for so long when I stupidly went to New York after agreeing to renovate it, and marry Verity. That's in the past, now we have to come together and work this mess out. I'd be glad if you can help in some way, Reuben, Abigail said. Reuben's face brightened a little. Of course I can. I can go over the finances. That's what I'm best at. Abigail knew she had to end the conversation quickly or she would cry. Well, that's good, thank you. I'll bring some paperwork back here later today. Are you all right, Mom? All Abigail could do was nod. She rose from the chair and walked back to the restaurant hoping that a tear would not escape, otherwise she was sure she would not stop crying for some time. Jacob called at Abigail's house the next day at precisely 11 a.m. as planned. Abigail spied a picnic basket in the back seat of the buggy as she climbed in. Are we having a picnic? Yeah, I thought I'd surprise you with a picnic. Abigail was normally fond of picnics, but not in weather like this. It was cold, almost sleeting. It's a little cold, isn't it, for a picnic? Jacob smiled and wagged a finger in front of her face. Just you wait and see. They rode in the buggy for what Abigail guessed was around half an hour. As Jacob pulled up his horse he said, this is the back parcel of my land. And that is where we're going. Jacob pointed to a small wooden cottage. Is that house on your land? Yeah, it's mine. Well, of course it's not my main house, you've been to my house. This is like a caretaker's cabin. It was built here years ago by the first Laps who owned this property. Oh, it looks just darling. It was a charming little cabin painted a pale shade of lemon. I'll show you inside. It's got a decent heater, we'll be able to warm up. Jacob heaved the picnic basket from the back of the buggy with one hand, and to Abigail's surprise, with the other hand he promptly took hold of hers. She looked up and smiled as warmth filled her heart. At least we don't have far to walk, Abigail said as the crisp fall air bit at her cheeks. A few quick strides later Jacob pushed the door open. Abigail walked through the door to be met by a wave of warm air. You've been here already today. She turned around to see Jacob looking very pleased with himself. Yeah, I came here to make it nice and warm for us. Look out there. Jacob pointed to the window in the sitting room. It was a floor-to-ceiling picture window, which overlooked a good portion of Jacob's land. It's so beautiful. Abigail's hand flew to her heart as the view of the landscape nearly took her breath away. The sky was dark with white and gray clouds moving swiftly, the grass and the trees were various shades of green. It's breathtaking. Here. Jacob offered Abigail a glass of wine. Oh, I don't drink. I didn't realize, sorry. Jacob moved the glass away and Abigail said, I'll just have a little, and took hold of the wine glass. Sit down. Jacob retreated into the small kitchen, which was behind the living room. You stay there and enjoy the view and the wine. I'll put the food onto platters. Abigail settled into the chair, pleased that she could still see through the large window. Would you like me to help? Jacob called out, no, it's my picnic. Abigail took a small sip of wine. It tasted almost the same as the wine she had tasted at the communion services, although this wine was sweeter. Minutes later, Jacob brought a blanket out and spread it on the floor. Now we can sit on the floor like at a proper picnic. 
Abigail got off the chair and sat on the floor as instructed. I do like the idea of having the picnic inside, in the warmth. Jacob disappeared again, and when he returned he had a large platter of food which he placed on the middle of the blanket. There was an assortment of cheeses, cold meats, bread, crackers, large grapes and a selection of sliced fruit. Oh, Jacob. This is amazing. He smiled. I was hoping you'd like it. And what's not to like? Abigail's eyes ran over all the food. I don't know where to start. Well, here's a plate. Abigail took the plate from his large hands and filled it with meat and cheese to start with. She noticed Jacob wasn't taking any food. Aren't you eating? I'm not really that hungry, but I'll eat a little. He put a small piece of cheese and a few crackers onto his plate. The two of them sat in silence, eating, drinking, and soaking in the view of the land. When Abigail was finished she placed her plate on the blanket and stretched her arms upward. Thank you for asking me here. This is the first time in a long time that I've been able to relax. Jacob mirrored her actions and stretched back as well. Why haven't you been able to relax? Just business problems. Now that David has gone, I've got to do a lot more things than I've had to do before. And you find that stressful? Abigail didn't know whether it was the wine, or whether it was that she was not used to being in such a stress-free environment, but she felt tears forming. She couldn't hold them back and before long tears flowed freely down her face. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cry. Jacob jumped to his feet, rushed to the kitchen and came back with a large white handkerchief for her. She dabbed at her eyes. Thank you. After she had stopped crying, Jacob sat next to her again and said, Abigail, I know something's wrong. Tell me, is there more than what you've told me? Abigail wondered what he was talking about. Wouldn't recently losing her husband be reason enough to cry? I've gotten to know you a little over these past few months, and I know that something is troubling you. You must tell me what it is. Jacob moved a little closer to her. Abigail took a deep breath, and her eyes stared through the window fixing upon the horizon. The businesses aren't doing as well as I thought they were. She swallowed hard. I just found out after David went home to be with the Lord. So I guess it was a shock for me. It's caused me some stress. I see. How much trouble are they in? Abigail shook her head and said, I can't discuss such things with you. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have mentioned it at all. You should have, Abigail. We're all family, we all help each other. Abigail closed her lips firmly together before she said, It's my problem and I'm sorting it out. Well, it's making you cry, so maybe you need some help to sort it out. Abigail closed her eyes briefly and said, It's just that David borrowed money from a bank. He said that he would never borrow money from an English bank. When he passed, I found out that he had done just that. Chapter 4 Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 33 Abigail woke up at the crack of dawn even before her rooster crowed. She stretched her arms above her head and remembered that she had to go into the restaurant later. Faith had told her the night before that Richard had something urgent to speak with her about. She had no idea what it would be about and assumed it would most likely be some sort of a ruse so he could speak to her. Abigail dressed quickly, partly due to the cold and partly to get the chores over with. She pulled her large coat around her and ran quickly to the chicken pen to collect the eggs. In days gone by, the job of collecting eggs was one given to the smallest child in the family, but now there was only Faith left and she was fast asleep. Once Abigail had done the necessary outdoor chores she was back in the house. She mopped the floors and dusted. Now she could cook breakfast for herself and Faith. As she entered the kitchen, she noticed Ben heading out the front door. Ben, have you had breakfast? No, not today. Ben hesitated just inside the door. Come back and I'll fix you some eggs. Thank you, that would be nice. Ben took off his work boots and headed toward the kitchen. Abigail fixed him some scrambled eggs and toasted some bread under the griller. How's the farm going, Ben? Yeah, it's going good. There's not much to do at this time of year now that the harvest has been done. I'm helping Dad make some new furniture for the house. He leaned in and whispered to Abigail, It's actually furniture for Faith, but it's a secret. Oh, that is so nice of you. She'll love that. 
Ben looked very pleased with himself. Abigail was satisfied that all her children had married well. Five minutes later, Abigail placed the eggs and toast in front of Ben. He rubbed his hands together. This looks wonderful. Abigail smiled as she served some food onto her own plate and sat across the table from him. Between mouthfuls, Ben said, Are you making any inroads with the restaurant? Faith mentioned a thing or two to me. I thought she might. I think everything will be okay, it'll take a little time though. Ben, I thought you'd left already. Abigail and Ben looked up to see Faith. I enticed him to have a decent breakfast, Abigail said. Thank you, Mom, but don't spoil him too much or he'll expect me to get up early and do it. Faith giggled. Abigail gave a small laugh. You never could wake up early, could you? No. Faith shook her head. That's why I always try and do the late shift at work, so I don't have to wake up early. Well, I'm finished now. Ben stood up and wiped the corners of his mouth with a napkin. He gave Faith a quick kiss on the forehead and then turned to Abigail. Thank you again for breakfast, Mom. Abigail chortled at him calling her Mom. You're welcome. After Ben left, Faith sat in front of her. Eggs? Abigail asked. No, I'll have some toast, but I'll get it. While Faith made herself toast, Abigail asked, So, do you have any idea what Richard wants to speak to me about? No, but it sounded serious. I'll get ready and leave soon. Do you want to come in with me? Abigail asked. Faith took a deep breath. Yeah, I'll come with you now that I'm awake. Abigail got in about an hour before the meeting with Richard Black was to start. She went over the figures for the past few days. The few Christmas functions they had had boosted the takings immensely. It was the first year that they had offered Christmas functions, and they had been a success. David had been against having functions at the restaurant, as he said that they would have been too much work for not much extra money. They had a wedding there for their friend and employee, Lily, but that was all. Abigail made sure she was waiting for Richard at the table they normally sat in, at the back of the restaurant. Before long he strode toward her. You look lovely today, Abigail, as always. Abigail smiled and nodded in response to his compliment. She never knew if his comments were genuine or not, but she had to admit they did give her a good feeling. He took his coat off and laid it over the back of his chair. I have something very important to tell you. His eyes darted around, and he scratched the side of his face in an agitated manner. Yes? Richard's hands were clasped firmly together on the table. I took all those receipts home from the kitchen. Remember the ones we discussed last time? Abigail nodded. They don't add up with what the suppliers have billed us. Abigail looked at him trying to make sense of what he said. You see, Shane gets a receipt from the suppliers for the food, then puts it in the tin in the kitchen. At the end of the month, the suppliers send an invoice. Richard ran an agitated hand through his hair while he squirmed in his seat. I've gone back over the past six months and none of them match up. So what does it all mean? Abigail nibbled on a fingernail, fearing the worst. Richard leaned in close. Shane is taking more food from the suppliers and only declaring around half that amount. When the invoices come in, you've been paying them without checking whether they are correct or not. Are you saying Shane has been stealing? Ordering extra food and only giving us half of it? Richard raised his eyebrows and nodded slowly. Exactly. No, I can't believe that. He's been with us for years. If he's been taking extra food from the markets, maybe he's hungry. Maybe we aren't paying him enough. Maybe he's been using it to feed people who are hungry. Richard continued to shake his head. Well, shouldn't that be your choice what you do with your money? Anyway, I've looked into it. He's been on selling the food to someone who has a stall at the farmer's market. He's had a nice little side business going on for some time. No, that can't be right, he wouldn't do that. Abigail remembered all the functions and all the family weddings Shane had attended. Richard tapped a finger on the table. I've checked it all out. What will I do? You'll have to fire him. Abigail felt as though she couldn't breathe. I don't know if I can do that. She put her elbow on the table and put her hand over her mouth. He's stolen from you and you're within your rights to go to the police. Abigail put her head in her hands. I can't believe that this is happening. 
I'm sorry to have to be the one to tell you, but better that you know what's going on. Look, if you prefer, you don't have to accuse Shane of stealing or even mention it. You could say that times have been tough and you need to let people go. Abigail shook her head. He'd never believe it. He'd know he'd never be the first to go, he'd be the last. Richard leaned forward and whispered, he might not believe it but he'll realize you found out about him stealing from you. Abigail watched his lips as he spoke, as if she were being hypnotized. She inhaled deeply and knew that he was right. She'd have to let Shane go. You're 100% certain about this? Absolutely. I can even take you to the stall at the farmer's market. Abigail shook her head. Richard handed over a small piece of paper, which he had just pulled out from his pocket. I've worked out the amount you should pay him if you let him go today. Tell him the business can no longer afford him, and then give him a check for this amount. He put the paper on the table, and tapped it heavily with one finger. I have proof of what he's done, and I should go to the police, that's what I should do. No, don't do that. Abigail picked up the paper and looked at it. Even though Shane had been stealing from the business, Abigail knew it would be hard for her to fire him. She had never fired anyone before, and the last person she thought would ever be fired from the business was Shane. Once again, thank you, Richard. We'd be in a mess without you. Richard leaned into her and patted her on the shoulder. You all right? Abigail stared at the piece of paper in her hands and said, I will be. They sat for a moment in silence before Abigail said, I'll have to see if Ruth can come in to cook until we find another chef. Well, I'll leave you to it. Richard stood up quickly. Good luck with finding another chef, and I'll see you in a couple of days. Abigail went at once to the lock drawer near the safe, where they kept any cash. She wrote a check for Shane in the exact amount that Richard had written on the paper. She took Shane aside to tell him. He was very quiet while Abigail spoke of the tough time that the restaurant was having, and when she'd finished her speech he was appreciative of the check. Once Shane had accepted the check he left. Abigail considered that things had gone smoothly except for the fact that now they had no head chef. Ruth can come in and I'll ask Lily if she can start working full-time again, she thought. Of course, I'll come in until you can find someone, Mom. Ruth said when Abigail visited her that night. Thank you, I hope it won't take us too long to find a chef. I'm surprised at what Shane was up to. Abigail brought one finger up in front of her lips. Hush, it's best if we keep things like that quiet. Ruth nodded, I understand. Chapter 5 Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Colossians chapter 3 verse 12 Abigail set out for the restaurant early the next day. She had to find a chef quickly. She popped a small sign in the front of the restaurant window and dropped into the local newspaper office to place an advertisement in the employment section. Just as she was leaving the office, she saw Jacob coming out of the post office. Hello, Abigail. She nodded her head, Jacob. Are you working all day? I've just come in for a little while. We're looking for a new chef, so I've just placed an advertisement in the paper. Care for a break? I was just about to have a cup of coffee, Jacob said. All right. They were a little distance from the restaurant, and there was a coffee shop right next door to the post office. How about we go in here? Abigail walked through the door ahead of him. They sat at a table near the window, where they could watch the people and the traffic go by. As Jacob fiddled with packs of sugar that were on the table, he asked, Tell me, why do you need a new chef? Did the other one quit? He just wasn't working out, that's all. Abigail shrugged her shoulders as she tried to speak in a casual voice, as if she wasn't worried about matters. I thought you said everyone working at the restaurant had been with you for a long time. Abigail drew a deep breath. Well, I wasn't going to say, but it turns out he was stealing from us, and that is partly why the finances are not so good. What? How did you find out? Richard Black did some detective work, and found out that he was over-ordering the food for the restaurant and on selling it to someone who had a stall at the farmer's market. The hide of the man. Yeah. It came as a shock to me. Tell me, Abigail, does Richard mean anything more to you than someone who's trying to help you in your business? Abigail breathed in sharply. 
she considered it odd to change the subject of their conversation so quickly. A.R. While she gathered her thoughts, she couldn't help but notice how beautiful his eyes were. They had green flecks scattered through them. Green, wasn't that the color of jealousy? Let me put it another way. Do you see Richard Black as a potential husband? Abigail's hands flew to her mouth. No, he's an Englisher. Sorry to ask, it's just that it wouldn't be the first time an Amish woman has married an Englisher. Why do you ask, Jacob? She was hoping he might admit to being a little jealous. Jacob carelessly gave a shrug of his shoulders. I just don't want you to get hurt, that's all. Why would I get hurt? Abigail was not going to let him off lightly. She was going to continue with her probing questions. I don't think a man like Richard Black would have respect for women. They stared at each other for a moment. Abigail wondered what he was basing his comment upon, as he hardly knew Richard Black. From what I know of him, he is a very kind and thoughtful man. I've heard things that's all. The corners of Jacob's lips turned down almost in a scowl. Jacob, you know very well I am not one to entertain idle gossip. Abigail at once thought of Jacob's mom, who was one of the biggest gossips in the county. I'm just concerned as a friend. Abigail thought what he said was a little laughable. He had jealousy written all over his face, but why had he referred to her as just a friend? Well, don't be concerned. I can look after myself. Chapter 6 Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 It was the day before Christmas, and Abigail forced herself out into the cold to attend a Sunday meeting at the Yoder's house. There weren't many people there because it was so close to Christmas, besides that, it was freezing. The singing at the gatherings was never as good when there were only a few folks there. With no music, the singing at the meetings relied on a handful of people who could hold a tune. Today, none of those were there, which made the singing hard on the ears. When the bishop spoke, Abigail tried to concentrate on what he said, but it was an effort to do so. He was reminiscing about the days of his youth, and what a wonderful time he had with his family and how lovely his mother was. Abigail's mind strayed to her own children. She was grateful that David died when they were older and not when they were younger. I suppose God has blessed me with that, she thought. She wondered if she had been as good a mother as she could to her girls. Yeah, I'm sure I did all I could for them and have brought them up the way God wanted me to. Straight after the meeting was over, old Mrs. Riley hurried toward Abigail. Abigail, I haven't seen you for a long time. Mrs. Riley was a tall and very large woman. Abigail reached forward to take Mrs. Riley's outstretched hand, and to Abigail's shock, Mrs. Riley heaved on Abigail's hand causing Abigail to lose her balance. The mishap ended as a physical embrace between the two, with Mrs. Riley's enormous arms around her. Abigail was not one for physical embraces, although it appeared that Mrs. Riley was. Abigail wondered if she would be missed if she slipped away before the meal. She longed to get home and sit in front of the fire so she could get warm. The Yoder's house was chilly and they only had a small stove for heat in their kitchen which barely took the chill off the air. As she wondered if she could slip away, she saw Jacob with his girls. Hello, Mrs. Fisher, Tracy said. Hello, Tracy and Lizzie. Dad says that we can sit with you. The children are allowed to sit at the same table today. Well, not that I'm a child anymore, but they still call me a child. That would be lovely, I'd like that. Abigail loved the company of children, but now she would have to stay longer in the cold house. She pulled up her black coat higher around her neck and wished she had worn warmer clothes. Jacob brought a blanket in from the buggy and spread across his daughter's knees while they ate. Lizzie and Tracy looked as if they could be twins, if only for the fact that one was taller than the other. They both had chubby red cheeks, startling blue eyes and ringlets of golden hair. Abigail admired how attentive Jacob was to them. While Abigail ate she noticed that the two girls had grown. They would soon change into young women. Young girls need their mother, she thought of how it would have been for her own children if something had happened to her. She was instantly sad for the little family that was left without their mom. She recalled what Jacob had said about the church being his family and having help every time he needed it. 
Where's your mother today, Jacob? It was too cold for her to come out. I went to fetch her, but she has the sniffles, so I suggested that she stay put. Yeah, that's probably best. Sitting with Lizzie and Tracy sent happy memories flooding through Abigail's mind of times she went to the meetings with her own young girls. She recalled her recent request to God about another child. She wondered if God had heard her. Maybe God will bless me with these children. If I married Jacob, then I would be mom to these two lovely girls, she thought. I would be happy with that, I don't need go through childbirth to be a mom. I can be just as much a mom to these two girls as I have been to my own children. The wanderings of her mind caused her to smile. Chapter 7 Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded having the same love being of one accord of one mind. Philippians chapter 2 verse 2 Thank you for driving me home, Richard. No problem at all. They had just finished one of their meetings at the restaurant when Richard had offered to drive Abigail home. Abigail, there's been something on my mind. Abigail spun around to face Richard. Yeah, what is it? I'm not sure how dating works in the Amish world, but I was wondering if you and I might give things a go. Abigail's hand flew to her throat. She was shocked he was interested, and at the same time wanted to laugh at the way he casually said he wanted to give things a go. There were two things against that idea in Abigail's mind. The first was that he was an Englisher, and the second was that she was fond of Jacob Lapp. Things would never work between them. She had to be polite, he'd done so much for her family. Amish can't date Englishers, I'm sorry Richard. She could not look at him as she spoke. Really? That hardly seems fair. This time Abigail did look at him because his response annoyed her. Richard, being Amish is a serious thing, it's not something that's taken lightly. We aren't the same as English people. We live by the Orning and follow God's ways. I believe in God. I'm not an ungodly person. I took pity on you when you were in trouble, and slashed my interest rate. Would an ungodly person do that? When she hesitated to respond he added, I don't think so. Abigail was at a loss, and said the only thing that made sense to her. You just don't understand. Well, if I'm not appreciated, I can always call in the loan. Richard pushed his bottom jaw out, and Abigail considered that he looked like a small child who could not have his way. Call in the loan? Abigail did not know why, but she wanted to laugh and had to control her emotions. Was she going a little crazy with all the pressure and worry in her life? Demand payment with interest right now. Abigail scanned her mind to try and recall the paperwork she had signed with him. Could he really do that? Richard, you know I don't have the money. Of course I know you don't have the money. He placed his hand on his hips and cleared his throat. I've been good to you, you know. Yes, I know you've been very good to us. Abigail did not want him to think that he was doing her a personal favor by loaning her the money, but she knew that he had shown them favor. No other lender of money would have been so generous to them, not even the bank. I'm sorry, Abigail. He rubbed a hand against his forehead. I shouldn't have said such a thing. You just get me so frustrated sometimes. I don't mean to. Abigail bit her lip, but she couldn't actually date him, he was an Englisher and he was mad at her for telling him so. Richard's eyes fell to the ground and he shook his head. You wouldn't call in the loan, would you? Abigail's hand clutched at her throat. No, I wouldn't. I was just angry and frustrated. Come inside, it's freezing out here. Richard followed Abigail as she walked away from his car. Abigail put her key in the lock and turned it. Just as she did so, she saw that Richard was reaching to pat Timmy who was lying on a chair next to the front door. She swung around. No, don't. It was too late. Timmy had lashed out and scratched Richard's hand. As he held his hand dripping with blood he said, You might have told me you have a vicious watch cat. Oh no. You're bleeding quite badly. Quick, I've got something in the kitchen for that. Abigail stood on a stool and reached to the top shelf of her utility room where she kept remedies for ailments. Come sit here. She held a small bottle of iodine in her hand. Richard sat in the kitchen and held his good hand under the other to catch the dripping blood. It's bleeding quite a lot. Abigail poured some iodine onto a clean cloth and wrapped it around his hand. Even though she was tending a wound, 
she could not stop the tingles of excitement that flowed through her body from touching him. As heat rushed to her face, she hoped Richard would think her face was pink because she was bending over. She moistened another cloth with water and cleaned away the blood from his other hand. The iodine will kill any of the germs and the wrap will stop the flow. I hope so. Abigail noticed that Richard was looking a little green. Do you feel all right? He inhaled deeply before he said, I'm not sure that I'm good with the sight of blood, especially my own. Abigail sat next to him. I'm sorry he did that to you. My fault, really. I should have known not to pat strange cats. His name's Timmy. I don't know why he does that. We've had him since he was a kitten, and he's never been mistreated or anything. Well, I suppose it's comforting to know that he's done this kind of thing before and it's not just me. It's not just you. Abigail stood up. I'll fix you a cup of tea. I think I need coffee after that, Abigail, please. Coffee it is. Abigail was so flustered that she had to stop for a moment and think what she needed to do to make coffee. Your cat probably heard the crosswords we had. Well, the crosswords that I had to you. Richard hesitated for a moment before he continued, I'm sorry for what I said. Will you forgive me? Of course I forgive you. Abigail smiled at him as she put two coffee cups on the table. Richard tapped his chin. I wonder if Timmy will forgive me. Abigail laughed. I don't think Timmy will. I don't think he's forgiving. He's just an angry cat. Richard smiled, and Abigail was pleased that he was looking a little less green. Abigail sat down and waited for the kettle to boil. Do you have any pets? Richard shook his head. I had a large white rabbit when I was a kid. I called him Mr. Funny. His face looked softer as he spoke. I can't remember how old I was, but I remember I got him for my birthday. Mr. Funny, as in Funny Bunny. Richard smiled and tossed his head back slightly. No, I didn't even think of that. I think I just found him funny to watch, so I called him Mr. Funny. Not a very thoughtful name, I know. Tell me more about him. Abigail was delighted to see the normally reserved Richard with his guard down, talking of simple things. My parents weren't happy because they didn't like any kind of pets. I don't remember who gave him to me. No pets? I don't know how people could live without animals. Well, it wasn't long before they grew fond of Mr. Funny, and my father even built him a hutch. Mr. Funny would go into the hutch at night, and through the day he'd have the run of the yard. And he was the only pet you ever had. Richard nodded. My parents worked hard, both of them, and they said that animals were too much work and too much money. Abigail thought it cruel to deprive children of growing up without animals. She had grown up with so many animals that she could not even comprehend a childhood without animals. Anyway, I had Mr. Funny for a few years and one day he disappeared. Abigail sucked in her bottom lip slightly as she wondered what happened to Mr. Funny. I'm sorry. You must have been really upset. I was, but I learned to cope with disappointments. Now that I'm older, I know that disappointments are a way of life, the secret is to learn to deal with them. Abigail put her head to one side. What do you mean? I've learned through every disappointment that I grow as a person. He wagged a finger from his uninjured hand at Abigail. I heard that someone once said, it's not what happens to you, it's how you deal with it. He shrugged his shoulders. Maybe that doesn't even make sense. I think I've lost too much blood for my brain to function properly. I forgot the coffee. Abigail flew to her feet. As she made the coffee, Richard kept talking. Anyway, I think I'm trying to say that I learn from every experience. At the end of each day, I ask myself what I've learned. I always learn from my mistakes and that way they aren't mistakes, they're lessons, Richard took hold of the coffee cup that Abigail offered him. She sat and then took a sip of coffee. I see. That's a good way to look at things. Richard stared into her eyes and raised his cup to her. Thank you. How's your hand? Do we need to take you to hospital? Richard laughed. I think you've done a swell job. I'd let your cat scratch me some more if it meant you would hold my hand again. Abigail's heart raced at the thought of holding his large hand again. She moved her gaze away from him. Chapter 8 
Know therefore that the Lord thy God he is God, the faithful God which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 9. Abigail loved Christmas, it was her favorite time of year. Her house was decorated with paper angels and stars that Abigail's young grandchildren had made in school. Abigail sat white candles in the windowsills and lit them. Abigail looked around at her family gathered in her house. Her five girls and their five husbands made for quite a crowd. All of them with the exception of Faith and Ben had children, so it made for a noisy bunch. The weather had gotten a little warmer, which it normally did just before it snowed. Abigail looked out into the velvety night sky to see if she could see any signs of snow. Instead of snow, she saw the headlights of a car coming toward her. Abigail knew the car could only belong to Richard Black. How's everyone going to react to Richard Black? They'll wonder what he's doing here. He's most likely paying a friendly visit, but they won't know that. Who is it, Mom? Abigail turned to see Verity. Oh, it looks as if it's Richard Black, I'd say. As quick as a flash, Faith stood between the two of them. Yeah, Richard Black, one of our new suppliers. Faith giggled in a nervous manner, and Abigail knew that Faith was still trying to cover up who Richard Black was, forgetting that she'd already told Verity and Reuben of him. Thankfully, Verity ignored Faith's mistake, while Abigail waited for Richard to approach the front door. When Richard stepped through the door he took his coat off and looking around. I'm sorry, looks like I'm interrupting something. No you haven't. Come in. This is for you. Richard handed Abigail a present wrapped in red paper with a large gold bow. It's just a token. Abigail unwrapped it to see it was a pillow with a needle-worked cat, and the cat looked exactly like Timmy. She smiled and looked up at him. Thank you, that was a lovely thought. Abigail tucked the pillow under her arm, stood back and let Richard walk further inside. This is everyone, my whole family. Richard scratched his chin while his other hand was tucked inside his coat pocket. Looks like I am intruding. The husbands introduced themselves and shook Richard's hand. After all the introductions were over, two of Abigail's son-in-laws moved over to make room for him on the couch. You'll stay and eat with us, won't you? Faith asked. No, thank you. Richard rose from the couch. I should go. Faith stood up and said, Nonsense, sit back down, we'd love it if you'd stay. Yes, do stay, Abigail said. Richard raised both hands in the air. If you're sure, then I'd like to stay. Abigail simply said, Good. I believe we know each other, Richard, but I can't think where from, Reuben said. Richard nodded. I believe we have a mutual friend in New York, Robert Griffiths. Ah, yes. Reuben swallowed hard. Robert Griffiths was the man who encouraged Reuben to go to New York years ago to make his fortune. Going to New York kept him away from the Amish and away from Verity for a good many years, more years than he had planned. They were interrupted by a loud knock on the door. Faith raced to the door and opened it to see Jacob Lapp with a huge basket in his hands and his two daughters standing either side of him. Merry Christmas, Faith. Merry Christmas to you too, Jacob, Lizzie and Tracy. Abigail came to the door. Jacob. Hello, Tracy and Lizzie. You're just in time for dinner. You'll stay, won't you? We've just come for a quick hello, Jacob said. Oh, could we stay, Dad? Lizzie pulled on Jacob's arm. Tracy said in a low voice, Please, Dad, they want us to stay. Please do stay, Jacob. We've more than enough, Abigail said. If you're sure it's all right, we'd love to. The girls hurried to where the younger children were playing in the corner. Richard's eyes were fixed intently on Jacob as they politely nodded to one another. When dinner time came, the six children were seated at their own small round table while the eight adults sat around the long rectangular table. After serving food on the children's plates, Abigail put different dishes of food on the center of the table for the adults to serve themselves. The table was filled with fried chicken, roasted lamb, roast vegetables, ham and cheese casserole, sausage balls, and coleslaw. Once everyone was ready to eat, Abigail said, Richard, you might not know this since you haven't eaten with us before, but we just take a moment before we eat to give thanks to God for the food in silence. Richard nodded and closed his eyes along with everyone else. Once all eyes were opened again, Richard said, That is a fantastic spread of food, Abigail. Thank you, everyone brought something, Abigail said. 
Speaking of bringing something, my mom sent over a fruit cake. She said it was a special Christmas cake, Jacob said. I put it over there in the kitchen. Oh, lovely. Be sure to thank her for me. Before Abigail served herself, she made sure everyone had access to all the platters of food. Jacob smiled and turned to Richard. And do you have family living locally, Richard? No. Jacob looked at Richard, waiting for him to elaborate, but Richard popped a forkful of fried chicken in his mouth and avoided eye contact with Jacob. It was as though Richard thought a one-word answer was sufficient for dinner conversation, either that, or he was deliberately being rude. Abigail broke through the frosty silence when she said, I believe all Richard's family aren't from around here. Richard gave a low grunt which could not be recognized as a word. Jacob continued, It's just that I'm surprised you would want to have an Amish Christmas when you could be having Christmas with? My own kind? Do you mean having Christmas with other Englishers? Richard's voice rose. A hush fell over the group, and even the children fell silent. Jacob moved uncomfortably in his chair. I didn't mean to offend you, Richard. Richard sat up straight in his chair. For your information, my grandmother was Amish. Abigail did not like the direction the conversation was taking. She was certain that Richard Black's grandmother was not Amish, or he certainly would have mentioned it at least once in all the time they had spent together. Really? Would we know her then? Jacob asked. Richard cast his eyes to the table and mumbled, I don't know. Well, what was her name? Jacob's eyes were fixed on Richard. Rather than answer, Richard shook his head and cut a piece of fried chicken. Abigail considered it was like watching two stallions sizing each other up before they struck. How can we believe what you say if we don't have a name? Jacob's tone was full of agitation. Abigail gasped at Jacob's words. After more silence from Richard, he looked straight across the table at Jacob and said quietly, her name was Elizabeth Violetta Blau. She was born into an Amish family and ran away when she was 16 to marry Thomas Black, my grandfather. Abigail was more than a little surprised. She had considered Richard to be making up a story to goad Jacob, but now she believed that it was true. Richard, you never told me of your grandmother. I wasn't hiding the fact that I've got Amish roots, it just didn't come up in any of the conversations we've had. Was her family from around these parts? I don't recall the name, Verity said. Richard shook his head. She never talked much to the family about being Amish, but I have no reason to believe that she wasn't from around these parts. This is where my grandmother and grandfather were living and where they raised my mother. And what of your mother? Jacob asked. Richard gave Jacob a steely gaze. Am I under some sort of inquisition? Richard turned his lips upward into a smile, but his eyes were cold. Let's lighten up the conversation, it's Christmas after all. I didn't know talking about your family would be something you consider to be sad, or some big secret. So I'm sorry, it's just that I like to know who I'm eating with. Jacob stared back at Richard. Abigail wondered whether Jacob's words were directed at her. Did he think that she should have known Richard better, before she had so many meals with him? He could not possibly know the frequency of their dinner dates though, it surely had to be a coincidence. Ben cut through the tension by saying, well, maybe it's a conversation best left for another time. Faith asked, how's your mother, Jacob? Abigail noticed that the children must have sensed that the tension had eased, as they began to chatter amongst themselves again. Jacob turned to Ruth's husband. How's the new horse coming along? While Ruth's husband spoke, the children became noisy again, before Abigail quietened them with a stern look. As soon as Ruth's husband had finished speaking, Jacob said, I don't recall anyone named Blau from around these parts. Jacob tapped his fork on the table. Abigail's shoulders tensed as she hoped that they would both stop talking as they were. Well, maybe it was before your time, since you're only 25, aren't you? Richard sneered. Abigail knew that Richard was making the point to both Jacob and herself that Jacob was much younger than she. Why don't you just admit that you're making up a story to impress Abigail? Jacob snapped. Jacob. Please, we're having Christmas dinner. Abigail reached her hand out toward Jacob in an effort to shush him. So happens, I don't have to make up things to impress a woman as you might have to. There's an old saying, don't judge others by your own standards. Richard's eyes glistened with rage as he stared at Jacob. Why you? 
Jacob sprung to his feet and stepped toward Richard who stood up just as quickly. Ben and Reuben jumped to their feet and threw themselves between the two men. Stop it both of you. Abigail's voice rose. I've had quite enough. I just want a peaceful Christmas dinner. Will you both go? Abigail stood and walked to the door. And leave me alone, both of you. She looked from one to the other. Richard opened his mouth to say something but then closed it before a sound came out. Jacob hung his head in silence and walked toward the door. I will have Verity and Reuben take Tracy and Lizzie home when they are finished. There's no reason they can't stay. Abigail called to the children who were still seated at the kitchen. You'd like to stay for a while longer, wouldn't you girls? Yeah, Mrs. Fisher, they replied in unison. Jacob stood in the doorway and said, I'm sorry, Abigail. He stared at her for a moment before he left. Abigail folded her arms and waited for Richard to leave as well. She sensed Richard's eyes on her, but her gaze remained fixed firmly on the door in front of her. Richard walked toward her. I'm sorry too, Abigail. I'll be in touch. He strode out the door into the cold night air and headed to his car. Abigail returned to the table. I'm sorry, everyone. Let's enjoy what we have left of our Christmas dinner. Ruth's husband said, and now there's more food for us. Everyone laughed at his comment, and even Lizzie and Tracy giggled. Chapter 9 O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like unto thee, or to thy faithfulness round about thee? Psalms 89-9 The new year was a new start. Abigail examined her heart. She knew she had bitterness over her current circumstances, and anger toward her late husband. She prayed, God please create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. The words were from Psalm 51, her favorite scripture. Abigail had not heard from Richard or Jacob since the disastrous Christmas dinner. She wondered if having a man in her life was worth the trouble if it brought strife and unpleasantness into her life. Determined to return to her own interests, Abigail joined the women's needlework group that met every Tuesday morning. They took it in turns of meeting in each other's homes. Abigail knew at some point she might have to go and see about getting some spectacles, as her fine embroidery stitches needed a keen eye. Abigail always made sure she was sitting in the brightest light possible to do her sewing, and she found sunlight to be the best. When she sewed in the sunlight she didn't squint at all. The needlework group was made up of only four women other than Abigail. They were Abigail's daughter Ruth, Ruth's friend Sissy, Betsy and Liz. Betsy and Liz were a good fifteen years older than Abigail. Abigail drew her own scene to embroider onto a cushion cover. It was a complicated scene of a barn raising. She saw something similar some time ago for sale in one of the local craft shops. The idea always stuck in her mind as something she wanted to try, but she was unable to find a pattern for it so sketched her own. She drew the scene in pencil. It took some time to get it right, but once she was satisfied with it, she traced it in a fine tracing pen that would not be visible once the stitches covered it. Abigail considered her embroidery was starting to resemble her life, she was making it up as she went along. She had a black and white sketch to work with, and with nothing to guide her on colors had to choose them as she went. Abigail could only hope it would look coordinated when it was finished. Ruth was doing a cross-stitch wall hanging of horses, and she of course was working to a proper pattern. The older ladies were proficient at needlework and quilting, they spent all their spare time doing one or the other. Betsy and Liz were both doing a quilt, even though it was supposed to be an embroidery group. As Abigail concentrating on the small stitches, the tension drained from her body. The funny stories the ladies told, along with their laughter, made for a delightful time. On her way home, Abigail looked at the road ahead between her horse's ears. She could rely on her eyesight well enough to drive a buggy, but the difficulty she had seeing small stitches and small print was increasing. She decided that the very next day she would make an appointment to see someone about getting some glasses. Once she rubbed Blackie down and put him in the stable, she tried to remember some other things she liked to do besides sewing. There was nothing she could think of, when the children were small she had no need for pastimes. Life was quieter now with David gone, although now she had the businesses to worry about. As soon as she thought of the businesses, her shoulders tensed. Chapter 10 And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter 
For thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning inasmuch as thou followedst not young men whether poor or rich. Ruth chapter 3 verse 10. Mom, Richard is here and he wants to speak with you, Faith said as she stuck her head around the corner. Abigail rolled her eyes. Okay, tell him I'll be out in a moment. Abigail was in the middle of cleaning the staff area in the restaurant. She made her way out to see Richard where he was sitting at his usual table. Richard stood as she approached. Abigail, I'm so sorry about the way I behaved at Christmas dinner. I admit that it was awful, I was awful. It was unforgivable. Sit down. Abigail sat and directed Richard to sit back down. As soon as he sat, she said, Yeah, it was awful, but I accept your apology. You were right to tell us both to leave. When or if I see Jacob again, I will apologize to him as well. Abigail pressed her lips firmly together and nodded. She had forgiven him, but she was not at ease with him. Richard leaned slightly forward and lowered his voice, Abigail, I have something else to tell you. Abigail raised her eyes and nodded. I might as well tell you now, Abigail, that I intend to join the Amish. No. Abigail laughed and put her hand up to her mouth. When Abigail noticed that Richard was not joining her laughter, she stopped laughing abruptly. You're joking, aren't you? No, Abigail, I'm not joking at all. He drummed his fingers on the table. I've already spoken with the bishop, and he's advised me what I need to do. Abigail stifled a gasp and it sounded like she coughed. What did he say? He said that when people want to join the Amish, they stay with a family for a time, to see if the lifestyle is what they think it'll be. He suggested the Miller family. Abigail took a while before she responded. Audrey and John Miller. Yes. I met them yesterday, and they're happy for me to stay with them. Abigail put her hand to her head. This was the furthest thing from her mind. She never thought that Richard Black would ever think of joining the community. Do you know what it means? Abigail immediately wished she could take the question back, of course he would know what it meant. What I mean to say is, could you really live without all the modern conveniences that you've grown up with? Richard leaned back slightly in his chair and tilted his head to the side. It's not what I'd lose, it's what I'd gain. I want to know God, like my grandmother's family did. I've always known there's something missing in my life. I believe God is the only one who can fill that hole. Abigail's mind was drawn to her own circumstances. She had God in her life, and knew it was not a guarantee of filling holes and was not an automatic ticket to happiness. Things like that need to be worked on with continual attitude adjustments and prayer. So you're not doing it for me, then? Abigail bit her lip, she knew it was presumptuous of her to ask but she had to know. It was such a huge step for a person to make, and she did not want him to do it for the wrong reasons. Richard smiled and said, I'm doing it for me, but I'm willing to accept any bonuses that come with my choice. Abigail took a couple of deep breaths. I'm happy for you then. Everyone must follow what's in their hearts. I'm doing research to find out all I can about the Blaus, my grandmother's family. I've been doing some thinking about the name Blau, and I vaguely remember an elderly lady who lived on the edge of town. I think we called her Mrs. Blau but I'm not sure. She never mixed much with people and rarely went to meetings. I wonder if that was a relative of your grandmother's. Maybe a sister or something. Did your grandmother have siblings? I'll find out soon. I'm going through the marriage and birth records with a minister's wife, later today. Richard slapped his hand on the table. Why don't you come with me? I'd be interested in what you find out, but I've got too much to do today. Richard hung his head and looked disappointed. Abigail considered he looked like a spoilt child who had been denied something for the first time. When do you move in with the Millers? Next week. It's a good idea to stay with someone, I guess. There's so much to learn of the Amish ways. I could ask you so many questions. You can ask me anything you like. I'll save it for the Millers. I've already asked the bishop many things. Abigail shook her head as she tried to take it all in. It's all happening fast. Richard chuckled. I've always been impulsive. Not that I haven't put a lot of thought and prayer into this, I have. Abigail nodded in agreement and licked her lips wondering what an appropriate response should be. 
She was in shock and did not want to say anything to discourage him. Richard drummed his fingers on the table once more. I've always lived on my own, so I'm not sure how I'm going to live with a family. I've been on my own since sixteen. Abigail wondered if God had used her to bring Richard Black back to him. Was Richard Black the one God had chosen for her when she asked him for a new man? Abigail hoped that God had chosen Jacob for her. Jacob was dear to her heart, and she was growing fonder of him every day. As she watched Richard drive away from the restaurant, she wondered what he would do with his car. Abigail put her hand over her mouth and giggled at the thought of Richard Black in a loose white shirt, straw hat, suspenders and driving a buggy. She never thought she would see him in plain Amish clothing. Abigail looked up at her house. She was glad to be home after a busy day. Moments after she pushed her heavy front door open, the sound of a buggy vibrated through her ears. She turned on her heel to see Jacob's buggy heading to her house. She stopped still and waited for him to pull up. Jacob quickly jumped out of his buggy and came to the bottom steps of the porch. Instead of his usual pleasant face, his face was as dark as a thunderclap. I was just about to come into the restaurant today until I saw you speaking closely with Richard Black. After all the trouble he caused on Christmas Day. What was he doing there? Abigail was tired after a busy day and didn't much feel like having to explain herself. Don't I even get a hello? I'm sorry, Abigail. I'm a little miffed. Come inside and I'll tell you what Richard was doing at the restaurant. Abigail walked in and sat on the couch in the living room. She considered that it wasn't really Jacob's business what Richard Black was doing at the restaurant, but she was too tired to say so. Jacob sat in a wooden chair opposite her and remained silent. He was just telling me that he is going to be staying at the Miller's, and if everything goes well he will be returning to the Amish. Jacob jumped to his feet and paced the floor. Return to. He never was Amish. No, I didn't mean that. Those were my words, not his. What I meant to say was that he intends to join us if the bishop accepts him after a time. Jacob continued to pace and his hands curled into fists. You know he's only doing it for you. The man hasn't got a genuine bone in his body. Abigail flew to her feet. Jacob Lapp, I'm surprised at you saying something such as that. He is a good man, and he is listening to God's words to his heart. I think it's admirable that he would even consider turning his back on the life he's known to start a new one for God. Besides, you were just as much to blame as Richard over what happened at Christmas dinner. Richard apologized to me. Jacob looked at Abigail for a time before he sat down. I'm really sorry, Abigail. Will you forgive me? That man always makes me quick to anger. Yeah, I forgive you. Richard said that he will apologize to you when he sees you next. Jacob cast his eyes downward and said, Yeah, I'm sorry too for the other night. I don't know what came over me. Jacob bowed his head and said softly, I fear that your affections will be to him instead of to me. Abigail smiled and said, Jacob Lapp, my affections are to you. Jacob looked up and smiled. Enough to marry me? Abigail's hand flew to her chest as if to still her heart from racing. I'll have to think about it, Jacob. Even though she wanted to marry again, her thoughts of marriage were in the future, not in the present. It was too soon. What is there to think about? Where would we live? Jacob opened his mouth to speak but before he could, Abigail continued, What about your daughters, would they accept me? Tracy and Lizzie love you. You would live with me and let Ben and Faith live here. He waved his arm in the air. A heavy weight lifted off Abigail's shoulders and she was sure she even saw it float away. It was nice to be wanted and loved again. Forgive me Jacob, I must ask this, would you have asked me to marry so soon if it weren't for Richard Black? Jacob remained silent for a while. Yeah. He slowly nodded his head. I'm sure I would have. In bed that night, Abigail wondered why she was so hesitant to say yes to Jacob when he asked her to wed. The plain truth was that she was also fond of Richard Black, and maybe she might grow to like him more when he was baptized into the Amish faith. Soon she would have told Jacob either yes or no. Abigail turned onto her side, disturbing Timmy who let out a low growl. Oh hush Timmy naughty cat. If she married either man, her money troubles would be over because both were financially secure. But Abigail wanted to stand on her own financially. 
she had learned not to put her trust in a man. She had put blind trust in David, and that certainly had not worked out well for her. Abigail learned that she should only trust God. Although Richard had not asked her to marry, she had a funny feeling that once he was settled into the Amish way of life that he would ask her. Hours later, Abigail beat her pillow with her fists as she could not sleep. She was sure that her once soft pillow had suddenly formed lumps. Abigail tossed and turned the rest of the night, as memories of Richard and Jacob replayed before her eyes. There were the two of them fighting at the Christmas dinner, along with snippets of Jacob's jealousy and Richard's condescending words to Jacob. Maybe neither man was for her. Abigail woke with a start at the sound of the rooster, and then pulled the covers over her head. She could not remember what she had to do that day, all she knew was that she wanted a little more sleep. Even Timmy didn't growl when she moved the covers, which she took as a sign that she should stay in bed for just a few more moments. Mom, are you all right? Abigail threw back the covers with a start when she heard Faith's voice. Mom, your hair. Abigail reached for her hair and for the first time since she cut it, she was filled with regret. Yeah, I cut it. Your beautiful hair. Why? Abigail ran her hand through her shoulder-length hair before she spoke. It was too hard to look after. Abigail pressed her lips firmly together. That wasn't entirely true, she had cut her hair in anger, anger at life or God or maybe anger at David. When did you cut it? Why didn't you tell me? A while back. Pay it no mind, it doesn't matter. Abigail missed her long tresses, but it was too late to do anything about it, there were too many other more pressing matters that required her attention. It does matter. Mom, your hair was beautiful. Yeah, but it's done now. Abigail knew her hair was a rare shade of red and threw golden light when the sun shone on it. You've been full of surprises lately. Are you feeling all right? Faith leaned against the doorframe with her arms folded over her chest. Yeah, I'm all right. I'm getting up now. I didn't sleep much last night. Faith shook her head. I cannot believe you cut your hair. Abigail sat up in bed and ran her hand through her hair once again. It'll grow. And it's not like you to stay in bed this long. I'll make you breakfast while you get ready. Faith walked away. Abigail changed into her dress, fixed her hair and put her prayer cap on before she joined Faith in the kitchen. She sat down at the long wooden table in front of scrambled eggs and toast. This looks good, thank you. What are you doing today then, Mom? I'm not sure. I have to find a new chef, don't I? Mom, are you sure that you're all right? Yeah, I've just got a lot on my mind at the moment. I'll come good. Abigail could not tell Faith that Jacob had asked her to marry him and Richard wanted to date her. There was just too much happening in their lives all at the same time. After dark that night, Abigail was disturbed by a loud knock on the door. She wondered who it could be, as she hadn't heard a buggy. Whoever was knocking on the door must have come by car. Richard Black was standing in the doorway when she opened the door, and he did not look happy. What's wrong? Abigail was immediately concerned as she'd never seen Richard look so upset. He did not speak so Abigail said come sit down. She stepped back for him to enter and closed the door behind him. Abigail, I feel terrible that I ruined Christmas dinner. Such an important time of year and I made such an idiot out of myself. Abigail waved her hand in the air. I told you to forget it. I've already forgiven you. You had me worried, I thought you had some bad news. Richard shook his head. I'm the only bad news around here. Abigail had to stifle a smile at him sounding so overly dramatic. She didn't know whether he was fishing for sympathy or whether he was genuinely distressed. Don't speak like that. She gave him the benefit of her doubt. That's how I feel, Abigail. You invited me into your home with your family at one of the most important times of the year, and I behaved dismally. Please forgive me? Again I forgive you, now please forget it. You don't need to keep asking for forgiveness. Now you need to forgive yourself, put it out of your mind. I will. He looked at her and a cheeky grin spilled onto his face. If you'll come have dinner with me tonight. Abigail considered she might have been correct. This was all an act to have her go to dinner with him. Tonight. Yes, tonight. Abigail badly wanted to say that she had to cook for Ben and Faith but they were having dinner with Ben's folks. 
Abigail scanned her head for an excuse, but none came quickly. Okay, that would be nice. Richard clapped his hands loudly and his face lighted up. Excellent, let's go. Abigail took her heavy coat off the clothes peg near the back door and joined Richard in his expensive black car. It's lovely and warm in here. I'll turn the seat warmers on, and that will really warm you up. In a moment, Abigail's seat was warm, and she felt as if she were sitting on a large hot water bottle and had one against her back as well. You'll miss your car, won't you? Well, we should find a way to get these into buggies. Abigail could not work out whether Richard was serious or not. She had to admit, it sounded like a good idea if he could make it work. Some people have gas heaters in their buggies. I wonder how they could make something that warmed the seats. Richard shrugged his shoulders. There would be a way, I'd imagine. It would hardly be worth bothering about. It's not as if most people in the world own a buggy. Richard laughed. His comment reminded Abigail that he was very much interested in things that were worthwhile financially. His mind was focused on making dollars. Abigail told herself not to be critical. She had to be grateful that Richard had come along when he had. He not only gave them financial help, but also gave them practical advice regarding their business. What restaurant are we going to? We're going to one we haven't been to before. I've made reservations for 7 page M. You made reservations. What if I wasn't able to come tonight? You had this all planned. Yes, yes and yes, to all those questions. I haven't come this far in my life without planning. His eyes twinkled as he spoke. Abigail examined the sheer determination written on the face of the man sitting next to her. She had to admire those traits even though he was a little devious in his ways at times. Once Abigail sat on the elegant chair that Richard pulled out for her, she looked around the restaurant. The lights were dim, almost dark, and there weren't many people in the restaurant. It looks a little deserted, doesn't it? To Abigail's embarrassment the waiter who had shown them to their table overheard her comment and said, It usually gets busy around 8.30 so it's still a little early. The waiter handed them menus and disappeared. Richard studied his menu. Would you like me to order something for you? Abigail glanced up at him. No, I will find something. I just feel like something plain tonight. I could do with a big fat steak. Abigail ordered a roast chicken with steamed vegetables and Richard chose a steak with hollandaise sauce, baked jacket potato and a side of mixed green salad. I have something for you, Abigail. Richard reached into his pocket and pulled out a little box and placed it on the table. You have something for me? What is it? He said nothing and pushed the box toward her. She picked up the small dark blue velvet box and opened it. Her eyes were dazzled with a flash and a sparkle. She picked it up and saw that it was a large single-set diamond attached to a chain. Oh, it's beautiful. As beautiful as you. No, you are more beautiful than the most precious diamond, and far more valuable. It's a diamond. Abigail placed it carefully back in the little box. That was such a nice thought, but I can't wear jewelry. Amish don't wear jewelry at all. Abigail bit her lip. It was such a nice gesture, she did not want to upset him. Jewelry was something foreign to her, but she knew what a diamond was. Richard lowered his head, shaking it slightly. Forgive me, Abigail. I should have known. Actually, I'm sure I did know on some level. Thank you for the lovely thought, but you know I can't accept it, don't you? Yes, of course. I just want you to know how much you've come to mean to me. Richard pulled a face. I have trouble with my words. I thought I might say what I wanted to say with the necklace. He snickered. Now I see that it was silly of me. Abigail placed her hand on top of his. It was a lovely idea. It's so pretty. Thank you for thinking of me in that way. You're a rare kind of woman, Abigail. Abigail licked her lips, as her mouth had suddenly become very dry. The next morning as Faith and Abigail ate their breakfast, Abigail heard a low growling sound coming from outside the house. Did you hear that? Yeah, it sounds like growling or something. Both of them put their heavy coats on and headed outside the house. They huddled together as they walked around searching for the source of the noise. Can you hear it now, Mom? No, I can't hear it at all. Abigail's hands were cold and she placed them inside her coat. 
The sound came again, this time a long, slow growl. They both walked toward the sound and looked above their heads to see Timmy, high in a tree. It's Timmy, Faith said. How could he have gotten up there? Do you think he's stuck? Abigail had never known Timmy to climb trees. He had only been interested in eating and sleeping. Even when he was young he had never climbed trees. Faith said, I think he's stuck, that's why he's meowing. Come on Timmy, here kitty kitty. Timmy did not budge, and his green eyes glowered down at them from the fork in the tree. Abigail stared up at him. How are we going to get him down? Is Ben still here? Faith shook her head. No, he left earlier. I could call him and have him come back? Yeah, call him please. Faith went into the barn and called Ben's family's house, but there was no answer. No answer, Mom, she yelled. Who else can we call? Abigail bit her lip as she considered which neighbor might help them out. Jacob. Abigail nodded. Yeah, try Jacob. Faith called Jacob and no one answered. What about Richard? Faith suggested. It wouldn't take him long to get here in his car. Abigail considered the idea for a moment before she said, Okay, I'm sure he wouldn't mind. You phone him. He'd do it for you. Faith gave a little chuckle. Abigail hurried to the barn, looked up Richard's phone number in her book and called him. Hello, Richard. Our cat is stuck in a tree and he's terribly distressed. I was wondering if you'd mind coming over here to try and get him down. Richard said he'd be there in ten minutes. Just as Abigail placed the handle of the phone down, the phone rang. Hello? Is this you, Abigail? A male voice said. Yeah, is that Jacob? It's me, is everything all right? I saw that you just called me. I did. Timmy's stuck in a tree, and I just called to see if you could help us get him down. I'll be right over. Jacob promptly hung up the phone. No wait. It was too late, he'd gone. Now she would have both Jacob and Richard both trying to get Timmy down from the tree. Abigail could only imagine what sort of a scene that would create. Abigail hurried out of the barn and joined Faith who was still calling Timmy, trying to entice him down. Timmy looked uncomfortable and was staying put. Jacob rang back and he's coming over too. Faith stared at her mother, open-mouthed. Why did you let that happen? Abigail shrugged her shoulders and explained the confusion. Both Jacob and Richard coming here? That's a recipe for disaster. Faith put her hand to her head. Abigail nodded and knew it was likely a recipe for another disaster, like Christmas dinner had been. Minutes later, Richard's expensive black car pulled up behind them. He joined them under the tree. Do you have a ladder? No, not anymore. We had one once. I don't know what became of it, Abigail said. You want me to climb up the tree like a monkey? Richard raised his eyebrows causing his forehead to wrinkle. Abigail did not know how else to get Timmy down. I guess so. Do you know how much these trousers cost me? Richard turned about in a full circle with his hands on his head. I haven't climbed a tree since I was a child. I'd probably break my neck. Don't concern yourself then. Jacob's on his way, Faith said. Why is he coming here? Richard asked. Mom phoned him first, and when she couldn't get him, she called you, but Jacob called back and now he's coming too. Faith's tone was sharp. That's why. Abigail wished that Faith hadn't been so blunt. The next ten minutes were awkward. Now there were three of them looking up at Timmy, and the three of them were just as reluctant as each other to climb the tree. Everyone's heads turned at the sound of Jacob's buggy coming down the drive. Now we might get some help, Faith said. Richard turned to Faith. I'm not going to risk my neck for a cat that nearly ate me alive the other day. I've still got scars from that cat. And I've already told you how much these pants cost. A chill ran through Abigail's body as he mentioned how much his pants cost again. Nine hundred dollars for a pair of pants was horrendously expensive. Abigail had been brought up to be thrifty and had always made her own clothes for the family. There were so many things that could have been done with such a large sum as nine hundred dollars. Where is he? Jacob joined them under the tree and followed their gaze. The three of them pointed to Timmy high in the top tree branches. Jacob directed his question to Abigail. Do you have a ladder? She shook her head as Richard snickered. Okay, 
if I can just get to that low branch, I can make my way up to the top one. He looked about him. Give me a leg up, will you, Richard? Richard walked closer to the tree and gave him a boost, enabling Jacob to grasp the bottom branch. Seconds later, he was level with Timmy. Careful, Jacob, Abigail called, knowing Timmy's bad history with people. Jacob looked down. It's all right, animals like me. Richard snickered again at Jacob's comment. Jacob managed to pick Timmy up without him resisting. Got him. Jacob looked down. I'm not sure how to get down and hold him at the same time. Abigail saw that Timmy was holding onto Jacob with his paws wrapped around his neck. You might both have to stay there then. Richard laughed until he saw that no one was joining in his laughter and then he promptly stopped. As it happened because Timmy had such a grip on Jacob, Jacob was able to use two hands to climb down the tree. Thank you, Jacob. Abigail rushed forward to take Timmy. Timmy did not want to leave Jacob and clung to his neck. Ow, he's hanging onto me with his claws. Abigail laughed. It looks as though you have a new friend, he doesn't want you to get away from him. Jacob stroked Timmy's back. I told you, animals like me. Without warning, Timmy sprung from Jacob's neck to the ground. As everyone watched, Timmy walked slowly to the house up the porch steps and made his way inside the open front door as if nothing had happened. Doesn't seem to have bothered him too much, Richard said. Abigail looked from one man to the other. Thank you to both of you for coming here so fast. Richard turned to Jacob and said, I'm sorry for my behavior at Christmas toward you, Jacob. Richard put out his hand to shake Jacob's. Jacob responded by shaking Richard's hand. I'm sorry as well, I'm ashamed of my actions and my words. Abigail saw Faith looking at her, and she gave her a little smile as they both stood there and listened to the men make amends. Shortly after they shook each other's hands, both men went their separate ways leaving Abigail and Faith to return to breakfast. Abigail's heart was always toward Jacob, but she could not deny that she had an attraction for Richard Black. For the first time, she could see that Jacob was indeed a better match for her than Richard Black. They had the same beliefs and had the same Amish upbringing, something that was foreign to Richard. Richard Black would not have had an upbringing anything remotely like an Amish upbringing. As Abigail ate her oatcakes, she examined why she felt an attraction to Richard. After much contemplation, a notion occurred to her. Richard constantly made her feel wanted and attractive. He was always complimenting her, which led Abigail to feel a sense of pride. A chord struck in Abigail's heart when she realized that whenever she was pleased with Richard's compliments she was being prideful. I feel good when Richard is around because of what's coming out of his mouth and not from what's inside his heart, she thought. The difference with Jacob was that he was a good man, and she liked what she saw of his heart. He was a generous and kind person. The incident that had just occurred with Timmy, made it clear to Abigail just how great the difference between the two men was. Faith was being awfully quiet as she ate breakfast. They usually talked and laughed over the morning meal. What did Richard say, $900 for his trousers? Abigail said. I know. Faith swallowed a mouthful of food quickly and giggled. I think that's what he said. I couldn't believe it. It's wasteful. Why would he need to spend so much on clothes? Faith shrugged her shoulders and shook her head. He could have bought trousers for over 100 people for that amount of money. Abigail traced her finger along the grain on the wooden table. I guess it's not for us to judge. No, I suppose not. Faith took a mouthful of hot oatcakes followed by a sip of nettle tea. Did you like the way Jacob shot straight up the tree? Abigail smiled. Yeah, I did. Faith raised an eyebrow at her. Abigail leaned away from her. Now don't go giving me those looks, girl. He would be a good match for you, Mom. Abigail laughed hard before she said, I'm too old for him. Abigail considered she laughed a little too loud, but she did not want Faith to know her feelings for Jacob Lapp. I don't think so. Age doesn't really matter. Abigail leaned forward. That's not what you said when I was trying to match you up with Jacob not too long ago. Faith smiled. That was different, besides he has children and you wouldn't mind a man with children. Abigail knew that her daughter was right. She would welcome Lizzie and Tracy and love them as her own. Besides you've got something in common with him, you both lost your spouses unexpectedly. Faith stood up and put her plate in the sink. 
I'm liking Jacob more and more, for you I mean. Abigail put her head in her hands. Faith said all right all right. I won't say another word about it. I'll just say that I like the thought of the two of you together. You can't tell me that you haven't thought about it. Faith raised her hands in the air. That's all I'm saying. Good. These things happen if they're meant to happen. If it's God's will, it'll happen. Faith ignored her statement and cleaned the kitchen. Where's Timmy now, have you seen him? Abigail remembered that he had sauntered into the house, but she had not seen him since the two men left. Most likely on your bed as usual, Faith said. I'll go see. Abigail left Faith to clean the kitchen. She found Timmy curled up on her bed as if none of the morning's events had occurred. Timmy, you're a naughty boy. Abigail stroked Timmy, causing him to stretch, but he did not open his eyes. As she stroked his thick fur, Abigail realized that Timmy had not attacked Jacob like he had Richard. Not only that, he had allowed Jacob to pick him up. Abigail leaned forward and whispered to Timmy, You like him too, don't you? Timmy stayed fast asleep, but Abigail was sure she heard a soft rumbling purr. Chapter 11 The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God, God is not in all his thoughts. Psalm chapter 10 verse 4 It was during the busy lunchtime rush when Abigail saw Jacob enter the door of the restaurant. She waved to him in acknowledgement of having seen him. Jacob waited just inside the door for her. Abigail's heart beat faster when she saw him, and to know that he was waiting to speak to her sent shivers of excitement up her spine. You wanted to see me. Yeah, I can see you're busy but this won't take long. I want to ask you a quick question. Okay. Will you come back to my cabin again for another picnic? I'd like that but I can't stay away again not for so long. Just a quick lunch picnic tomorrow then, and I'll have you back home well before dinner. Yeah, I'd like that thank you. So tomorrow? She smiled at him and nodded. I'll pick you up at twelve. I'll look forward to it. Jacob gave Abigail a broad smile before he turned and left. Even though Abigail knew that she should be helping with the lunch rush, she stood there and watched Jacob walk away. He always stood so straight and tall and there was purpose in his stride. The next day Jacob called for Abigail as arranged, and they drove to the cottage. It's still as beautiful as I remember it. Abigail stepped out of the buggy without taking her eyes of the small cabin. Abigail turned to see Jacob lifting a heavy basket out of the buggy. Do you want some help? No. Laughter rang in his reply. I'm quite strong I'll have you know. I lift heavy things all the time. Abigail stood with her feet planted on the ground and her hands on her hips. I'm sure you do. Jacob walked past her. Abigail caught up with him and matched him stride for stride until they reached the house. Jacob set the box on the ground and unlocked the door. He pushed the door open for Abigail. Make yourself comfortable on the couch and I'll be there soon. While Abigail sat on the well-worn brown leather couch she wondered whether Jacob might bring up the subject of marriage again. She decided that if he did, she would certainly agree to marry him. I hope that I wasn't too dismissive of him last time he asked me. Jacob returned. Abigail, I must tell you something. Yeah. I must tell you the whole truth about something. He knelt on the floor next to her. Abigail's heart pounded so much that it nearly hurt. She managed to say. Go on. The truth is that the very first time you invited me to dinner at your place, I knew that you were the woman for me. Abigail smiled and looked down at her fidgeting hands in her lap. He continued, I'm no fool, I knew I was there because you were trying to match me in faith. Abigail looked up. You did. Jacob nodded. Yeah. He laughed. Faith knew too, I'd say. We both knew that we weren't meant for each other. I see. But from that moment my feelings grew for you every day. He sat next to her on the couch and took hold of her hand. I need to just say this straight out. He took a deep breath. Abigail Fisher, will you make me the happiest and most blessed man in the world by becoming my wife? Abigail inhaled deeply and she could not speak, but she could not draw her eyes away from his. Just nod if the answer is yeah, Abigail. Abigail gave a nod as she felt tears brim in her eyes. Jacob laughed and put his arm around her. We'll be so happy you and I. 
He kissed her forehead as she leaned into his strong shoulder. Neither of them could eat, so they held each other, pleased that at last they could admit their feelings to one another. Abigail knew she'd have to tell Richard that she was going to marry Jacob. She wasn't looking forward to it, but it was something that couldn't be avoided. She would have to wait for their next weekly meeting to tell him of her betrothal to Jacob. She would not tell anyone else until she told Richard face to face, she did not want him to hear it from anyone else. Two days before they were due for their weekly meeting, Richard called into the restaurant unexpectedly. I'm glad to see you're here, Abigail. I didn't know you'd be in today. What brings you here? Abigail asked. I wondered if you might have dinner with me again tonight? Abigail knew that her dinners with Richard would have to be a thing of the past. I can't have dinners with you anymore, Richard. Abigail looked about her and saw that the restaurant wasn't very busy. She attracted one of the waitress's attention and said to her, I'll be out for a while. She turned back to Richard. Let's go outside. To have a private moment, Abigail took him to the garden behind the B&B. &B. Abigail sat on one of the white garden benches and Richard sat next to her. There have been some developments in my life. Richard remained silent, and she sensed his intrigue which made Abigail even more nervous about telling him about her and Jacob. There was only one thing for it, she would have to tell him straight out. The thing is that Jacob and I are getting married. Richard flew to his feet. What? You can't be serious. His hand flew to his head. When did all this happen? We've known each other for quite a while now. It makes sense, that's all. Sense? Shouldn't marriage be about love? Abigail stood up to face him. Well, of course that too. Abigail did not know why, but she found it difficult to talk about such things as love. Of course she did love Jacob, but why was it hard for her to say it out aloud? You do love him then? Richard was suddenly close to her face peering into her eyes. Abigail took a step back. Yeah, I do. It's not a decision that I would make lightly. Richard sat back down on the seat and pulled her hands down so she would sit beside him. I see. Forgive my reaction. I was shocked, that's all. He leaned back slightly and looked straight ahead. I'm happy for you if that's the decision you've made. Thank you. That's the decision I've made. Abigail was confident that Jacob was the one for her, but at the same time she did not want to hurt Richard's feelings. This won't affect our business relationship. Richard's words rang with a coldness that Abigail had never heard in his voice before. No, I didn't think that it would. Just no more dinners. Richard's face reddened. All right. I'll respect your wishes and not ask you to accompany me to any more dinners. The tone in his voice deepened as he said, My feelings for you of course were purely friendship. I just didn't want to see you get hurt or see anyone take advantage of you. That's nice of you. I appreciate your kindness. You've been very good to me. Abigail contained the smile that wanted to break out on her face. Richard was pretending that he did not have romantic notions towards her, but weeks ago he told her that he wanted to date her. Offering her a diamond necklet was also confirmation of his feelings. Richard's face softened into a smile. It's partly because of you that I'm joining the Amish. Knowing you, your family and attending Faith's wedding allowed me to see the closeness that exists in the community. I've never had closeness and caring like that in my life. You soon will have. Abigail beamed at him. It was obvious to Abigail that he was annoyed about the news of her and Jacob, and he was struggling to make the best of the situation. I just want to say thank you, Abigail. Thank you. Abigail put her hand to her mouth to stifle a giggle at his first Pennsylvania Dutch word. Sometimes she didn't know when he was serious or having a joke. You probably know a lot of Pennsylvania Dutch already. Yeah, I think I do. Richard smiled. Is it a prerequisite? Abigail shrugged her shoulders. If you want to talk to people. I'll have to learn then. Abigail stood up and smoothed down her dress. Well, I should get back to work. It'll soon be the rush hour. Richard accompanied her back to the restaurant. All the best with everything, Abigail. I mean that sincerely. I know you do, thank you. I'll see you at our regular weekly meetings at the restaurant. Thank you, Richard.
She smiled at him, turned and walked through the door of the restaurant. The only other person who knew of Jacob and her plans besides her children was the bishop. Now Abigail and Jacob could tell his girls of their plans. Abigail hoped that they would be pleased. She knew that they liked her, but would they like another woman taking the place of their mother? That was one thing she was not sure of. Jacob pulled the buggy up at his house. Tonight was the night that Tracy and Lizzie would learn that Jacob and Abigail would be married. Abigail only hoped that they could accept her. Otherwise she was sure she would not be able to continue with the plans to marry their father. She hoped the girls would accept her as a second mother. She knew she would never replace their first mother in their hearts, nor did she want to. Jacob sat the girls down in front of Abigail and himself. I might as well tell you girls now that Mrs. Fisher has agreed to marry me. I knew it. Tracy jumped out of her chair. Yeah, we both knew it, Lizzie said. Tracy sat down again. I said it first. Yeah, but I told you that I was already thinking of it last night. Hush now, girls. It doesn't really matter who thought of it or said it first, does it? Abigail said, knowing she had her work cut out for her with keeping the two of them under control. Abigail had never experienced such spirited children in all the community. The two girls looked at each other and rushed at Abigail, putting their arms around her tightly. They made her feel welcome. You gonna come to live with us? Lizzie asked. Abigail laughed. I suppose I am. Tracy gave Lizzie a little push on the arm. Yeah, of course she is, she has to. Girls, do I smell dinner cooking? Jacob asked. Yeah, let's go, Lizzie. Lizzie and Tracy rushed to the kitchen to finish the meal that they were cooking. Abigail called after them. Do you want help with the dinner? No, we can do it by ourselves. Jacob sat close to Abigail. See, I told you they'd be pleased. That's good. Abigail put both hands to each side of her forehead. I was concerned about how they'd react. Abigail looked at the dining table and saw that it had already been set for dinner. The girls had already told her that they did not want any help, so she dared not enter the kitchen. Relax, you are the guest tonight. Just be happy to have a quiet time to sit next to me. Jacob took hold of Abigail's hand. I find it hard to relax. I feel I have to be doing something all the time, Abigail said. Well, not tonight. Dinner is ready, Tracy called. Jacob and Abigail helped carry the heavy bowls of food to the table. When they were seated they gave thanks for the meal. Then the girls immediately asked if they could help with the wedding. I'd like to sew your dress if I could, Tracy said. Abigail looked at Tracy's beaming face. I would have loved that, but I've already arranged for Lily from the restaurant to make my dress. She made Faith's dress. What could we do? Tracy rushed her words so much that they were hard to understand. You could help with the decorations and the food if you'd like. Abigail watched the girls' faces. We'd love to, wouldn't we, Tracy? Lizzie's face beamed. Tracy squealed loudly, yeah, we'd love to. When dinner was over, Abigail enjoyed the quiet ride home in the buggy with Jacob as he drove her back to her house. They aren't always that noisy, they were just excited tonight. You haven't changed your mind, have you? Jacob chuckled. Abigail laughed. Of course I haven't changed my mind. They're delightful even when they're noisy. To Abigail, a proper home was always one with children. Now she had a few years in which she could enjoy Tracy and Lizzie before they grew up. There's something I've been wanting to speak to you about for some time. Fear rippled through Abigail as she wondered what it could be. His voice sounded so serious, yet he had an air of timidity about him. Don't scare me, Jacob. What is it? I'd like to help your businesses out. Abigail stared into his face, which was lightened momentarily by a streetlight. What do you mean? Financially? Yeah, I'd like to pay the debts outright, and then you wouldn't have to worry so much. No, I couldn't have you do that. Abigail considered how ashamed David would be if he knew that another man had paid his debts off. I just couldn't. Have a think about it. I'm just trying to make both our lives easier. Thank you. I do appreciate your offer, even though I can't accept. The finances are improving, and the businesses need to be viable anyway. No good keeping them running if they aren't making money. 
Jacob nodded and looked down at the reins in his hands. I see. Thank you for the lovely dinner. Lizzie and Tracy did well. As they pulled up out the front of Abigail's house, she took hold of Jacob's arm and squeezed it. Don't see me in. It's late, you best be going home anyway. Yeah, best that I don't leave the girls alone for too long, even with their grandmother living nearby. As Abigail walked to the house, she saw the main light on and knew that Faith and maybe Ben were in the living room. Faith was sitting on the easy chair sewing and looked up as Abigail came through the front door. Hello, Mom. How did the Lap girls take the news that they're soon to have a new mom? They were very happy about it. Abigail took off her heavy coat. They are delightful children. They're very lucky to have you as a mom. Thank you, Faith. Abigail walked over and gave Faith a quick kiss on the top of her head. They want to help with the wedding all they can. That's good. Yeah, they wanted to sew my dress but I told them Lily has been given the job. So sweet of them. Faith was concentrating on her sewing. Abigail sat opposite Faith and leaned forward. There's something else I have to tell you as well. Jacob offered to help the businesses out. Faith dropped her sewing into her lap. Really you mean, with money? Yeah. Abigail nodded and held Faith's gaze. What did you say? Abigail shrugged. I was shocked of course and I said no, I couldn't accept his money. Faith nodded and picked up her sewing again. Still it was a lovely thought. I might have accepted, if I wasn't concerned that the money might be lost in a big hole. Abigail leaned back into the chair. No, the businesses have to stand on their own feet. Yeah, I agree with you. Faith nodded while her gaze fell back to her sewing. Is Ben asleep already? Yeah, he only just went upstairs a moment ago just before you came home. Abigail settled back and gradually closed her heavy eyelids. What are your plans for the wedding so far? Are we having it here or at Jacob's house? Faith's words startled Abigail as she was nearly already asleep. Abigail straightened up, so she would better be able to stay awake at least until she got into bed. I'm thinking we might have it here and then we can go to Jacob's place. I'll leave you and Ben to do the cleaning up. Abigail laughed and covered her mouth with her hand. Why don't you do that? Ben and I wouldn't mind at all. Especially now that we get to live here, for a time anyway. I'm sure you'll have plenty of helpers for the cleaning up. Thank you, Faith. Abigail remembered her first wedding. It was held in the very same house. She never would have guessed that she would marry for a second time. A second time and in the very same house. Chapter 12 Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Proverbs chapter 3 5-6 It was the morning of the wedding. Tracy and Lizzie were in charge of the decorations, and had arranged everything wonderfully. There was a floral arrangement for every table. Butterflies filled Abigail's stomach as she sat on her bed with Timmy listening to the commotion coming from the living room. The men had come early to help arrange the seats for the ceremony. Abigail ran her eyes around the room that David had extended on to the house for them. For an instant, she had a pang of yearning for the simple life she'd had with David. I can't think about that, I have to concentrate on the rest of my life with Jacob. Her feelings of love for Jacob were equal to her feelings she'd had for David. She spent a moment thanking God for all the people in her life, past and present. Abigail inhaled deeply, stood up and walked to the mirror. She pinned her hair and fastened her new prayer cap on her head. The prayer cap was made by Lily for the wedding. Abigail chewed on her bottom lip. I wonder what Jacob will think when he sees that I've cut my hair and it's not long, as he might expect. She tied the ends of her cap together. Can we come in? The voice was Verity's, but Abigail knew by the muffled voices outside her door that all her children were outside her door. Abigail opened the door and her five girls rushed in. They were all dressed in blue with white aprons, capes and prayer caps. Are you nearly ready, Mom? Ruth said. Yeah, almost ready. Abigail looked at her five girls, then she sat on her bed as her eyes brimmed with tears. What's wrong, Mom? Faith sat beside Abigail, pushing Timmy out of the way. Timmy responded with his typical low growl. I don't know whether I'm happy, excited or what. 
I don't know why I'm crying. She looked at each of her her girls. Look at you all. You're all grown up. It makes me a little sad. It sounds odd but I miss the younger girls you were before you all grew up. Verity wiped a tear from her eye. We must enjoy all moments, Mom. Ruth handed her a handkerchief and Abigail dabbed her eyes dry. Faith stroked her arm. This is a new start, Mom, but it doesn't take anything away from your old life. What you had with Dad or what you had with us still have with us. The girls all nodded. Come here and have a group hug. Abigail stood up with her arms open and her girls hugged each other. Abigail did not show affection often but today it was warranted. Now splash some cold water on your face and let's go out there, Faith said. Okay. When the girls left her alone, Abigail did as Faith suggested. Before she left the room she gave Timmy a cuddle while he was asleep, then left him alone to sleep. As she walked out of her bedroom into the living room, the first person she saw was Jacob. Abigail had made him a white shirt and a black suit to wear for the special day, and it fit him perfectly. When he smiled at her, her heart filled with a joy that she could barely contain. She knew that this was something that was meant to be. She was meant to be with Jacob, and he was meant to be with her. Tracy and Lizzie came rushing toward her. Now girls, give Mrs. Fisher some space. You can speak to her after the ceremony, Jacob said as both girls stood on their tiptoes to give Abigail a kiss. Lizzie whispered. Can we call you mom? Tears tingled at the back of Abigail's eyes once more, she sniffed and coughed in an effort to hold them at bay. Of course you can, you can both call me mom. The girls looked at each other with beaming faces, and then left her alone. Jacob stepped close to her and when he was by her side he said, Are you all right? Abigail patted her eyes to make sure they were dry. Yeah, I will be. We will have a good life together, Abigail. Abigail looked up into Jacob's soft and kind eyes. I know we will. Now come and we will greet our guests. Abigail and Jacob, and the seven children between them, stood outside and greeted the guests as they arrived. Once the many guests were seated, the bishop took Abigail and Jacob aside for a private talk while everyone sang hymns. The bishop's talk was a formality, and it didn't take long. They'd both been married before and knew what to expect. When the singing was over, Abigail and Jacob sat in the front row and listened to one of the ministers deliver a lengthy prayer. After the prayer, the bishop gave a sermon and scripture reading. When the bishop finally closed his Bible, he asked Abigail and Jacob to step in front of him. He asked them a couple of questions, which they agreed to. He then pronounced that they were man and wife, and closed the ceremony with a prayer asking for God's blessing on their marriage. A dozen or so women jumped up after the last prayer was finished. They were hurrying to have the meal ready, which was being cooked in an annex off from the kitchen. The men rearranged tables and benches ready for the wedding feast. Abigail looked at the number of people and guessed that there would need to be at least two sittings for the meal. The bride, groom, and their attendants always ate first at the special wedding table. It was strange to Abigail to sit and be waited on, as she was always the one to wait on others. She took a low, slow breath in and decided to enjoy every minute of her special day. Jacob sent tingles up her spine when he whispered in her ear, How does it feel to be Mrs. Lapp? Abigail laughed. I've been Mrs. Fisher for so long now that it might take a little time to get used to being Mrs. Lapp. I'm so happy we're married. Abigail leaned into Jacob's shoulder. I'm happy too. The ladies serving the meal came out in a whirlwind of activity and placed roast chicken, mashed potatoes, coleslaw, celery soup, and yeast cakes on their table. Abigail was careful not to eat too much, she was determined to leave room to sample all the wedding cakes. After the meal, Abigail and Jacob separated to speak to their guests. Moments later, Richard walked toward Abigail, who was standing next to Faith. Now I've been to two of the Fisher weddings, Richard said with a wry smile on his face. Faith said, that's right, you came to my wedding, didn't you? Maybe next time it will be your wedding. Abigail dusted off some lint that was on the shoulder of his dark suit. Richard threw back his head and laughed heartily. I don't think so. I'm not the marrying kind. That was before you became Amish. All Amish are the marrying kind. Faith tipped her head to the side as she spoke. Richard drummed a finger on his chin. Hum, that's something to think about, and for your information, I'm not officially part of the community yet. 
Abigail and Faith exchanged smiles. Anyway, Faith, yours was a lovely wedding and so was yours, Abigail. Abigail highly doubted that Richard would ever get married to an Amish woman. He did have his charms, but there weren't many Amish women who would be attracted to his kind. He was also older, which made things more difficult, as his choice of a wife would be limited to women who couldn't find a husband in their younger days. Unless he married a widow. Before I forget, I found a very good chef. He's speaking to Reuben tomorrow. He looked at Abigail. I took the liberty to arrange that, due to the wedding and everything. Abigail smiled. Thank you. Reuben will know if he'll suit the restaurant. That's what I thought. Forgive me, I shouldn't be talking business at your wedding. Just one more piece of news and I'll let you go and talk to your other guests. Abigail and Faith leaned in close to hear what Richard was about to say. I found the old family home. The old Blau residence, it's at the edge of town. Better still, it's going under the hammer next month. It's for sale? Faith asked. Yes. I've looked inside and it's a grand old place. It needs restoration, but I figure that's exactly what I need to keep me busy. That's wonderful, Richard. I'm happy for you, Abigail said. Me too, Faith agreed. As Abigail moved on to speak to her other guests, she realized that the old woman she had remembered at the edge of town could very well have been a relative of Richard's. The day had been a very long one. The games and singing after the second meal were fun. Everyone had a good time and enjoyed themselves. Once the wedding was over and nighttime fell, the buggy pulled up at Jacob's house, Abigail's new home. There were two very tired girls in the back of the buggy and Timmy in a large cardboard box. Jacob picked up the box with Timmy inside, and Abigail said, We'll have to leave him inside the house for a while until he gets used to his new home. Can he be my cat? Lizzie spoke breathlessly. Tracy laughed. Abigail turned around to face both girls. He can be everyone's cat, a family cat, but he does like to sleep on my bed. He does? Jacob asked. Well, we might have to get him a special cat bed. Abigail smiled. We'll see. Jacob looked at Abigail with a raised eyebrow. Abigail considered it might take her some time to get used to living in Jacob's house. She would also have to get used to Jacob's mother living close by. Her new mother-in-law had accepted the news of the marriage with great excitement, but Abigail knew that she would never be a friend of her mother-in-law, as she had been with David's mother. Days later, as they drove in the buggy to their first Sunday meeting as a family, Abigail looked back at the house and noticed that Timmy was sitting on the porch as if he were a guard dog. Tracy followed Abigail's gaze and laughed. Look at Timmy, he thinks he's a dog. Everyone looked around at Timmy and Jacob said, at least we know that the house will be safe while we're gone. Peace filled Abigail's heart. She had spent so many months being upset about the disappointments and trials she'd gone though, that she'd taken her eyes off God. She'd learned that a trial was not a bad thing. It was simply an opportunity to learn how to better trust in God. Abigail thanked him for her trials and everything she had learned from them. Thank you for reading The Trials of Mrs. Fisher. The next and final book in the Amish Wedding Season series is A Simple Change.